Hello again, everyone. Welcome to the second part of today's presentations of the second International Astrobiology Conference. I am Zainab and I will be uh, moderating this session. We are also uh, so close to end, but we are also so excited to listen more. Uh, in this session, we will be hosting Dr. Sean Go uh, Domagal Goldman. He is the head of the Planetary Systems Divisions at NASA's Goddard uh, Space Flight Center. He is an astrobiologist that is a member of several interdisciplinary teams, such as the Mars Curio uh, Curiosity Rover team. He, his research focuses on standards of the evidence for biological signatures, and today he will be talking about the, uh, the search for life on planets around the other stars with future space-based telescopes. Hi. Morning, everybody. Or, well, evening. I guess morning Morning to me. Yeah, uh, here it's evening. And welcome yes. to our conference. We are so happy to have you here. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, State, uh, if I didn't forget uh, to mention anything about you, no, I think you did. Okay. It was a great introduction. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Then stage is yours. You can start your presentation and I will get it to screen and I'm going. <laughs> okay. Right. And you want me to speak for about an hour, right? If I'm, if, if you can give me like a 10 minute warning, that'd be great. But I'll also try to monitor, monitor the time here on my watch as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, again, thank you for having me. My name is Sean Domical Goldman. I am a research space scientist and an astrobiologist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center here in the United States. Uh, I'm just outside DC. Um, that's where the, the Goddard Space Flight Center is. It's uh, our leading science center for NASA. Uh, we work with our colleagues across the agency and at JPL to build spacecraft. Um, and the point of that is to think about this question that I think a lot of us are interested in of, are we alone? And for an astrobiologist, what that means is we turn that question into something that we can study with science and the scientific method. And it means designing experiments to answer that question or parts of that question or things that can help us understand that question better. Um, and in my case, being a scientist at NASA, um, I am responsible for designing experiments that require spaceflight or uh, aircraft uh, flights. And so when you put those two things together, I'm an astrobiologist that wants to study this question of are we alone with science, and I'm a NASA scientist that wants to address questions with spacecraft as the experiments, um, then you you're, you turn into what I am, which is a, a person that, that looks at how can we use spacecrafts to other worlds or telescopes that we fly in space to address this question. And I, and I start there both to kind of set the context for everything to come, but also to say, there's a lot of other things that astrobiology requires. We need lab work, we need field work, we need ground-based telescopes. Um, all kinds of research has to happen in addition to the stuff I'll be talking about today. The part I'm focused on are the, the space flight missions, and it's going to be US and NASA centric just because that's that's the group I, I work with the most. I'll try to give some shout outs to the international community of space projects when I when when, when I am remembering them and they're relevant to the talk. Now I want to start here, um, home, Earth. Um, and what you're looking at here is satellite data from a NASA mission uh, called CWIFS. And CWIFS is looking back down on Earth and it's tracking life across the surface of the planet. Um, you can see this change over seasons on the continents as forests bloom in the spring and the summer, and then uh, the foliage falls away in the fall and the winter. You can also see it in the oceans. And by the way, that's two different detection techniques that are being used. We're looking for the leaf color in the trees on land, and we're looking for the pigment associated with, with uh, uh, chlorophyll um, for algae that, that grow in the oceans. Now, if you look for life on Earth, you'll see it across the globe. You'll also see it in just about every environment on Earth. If you were to go into some of these places that we cannot see life from, from space, and if you were going to go there on foot and look for life, as long as there's a little bit of liquid water, you'll find it. And that's true wherever we've looked for life. If we see liquid water, we also find life. 
Um, now, there's a couple very minor exceptions to that, but it's led us to this strategy of looking for water in other environments as the first place we're going to look for life on other worlds. Now, that doesn't mean that life is impossible without water. In theory, there's ways that that could work, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But the life that we know of today uses water. So the place we want to start our search, not end our search, but start our search, are the environments that we know life can thrive in on our home world. Now, we're doing this on myriad planets across the solar system. And as I'll talk about for most of this talk, beyond the solar system. I'll start close to home on Mars. Now, what's interesting to me about this, in addition to the fact that we're searching for life, is when you think about all the searches for life we're going to do on all these different planets, it's going to give us an understanding that's greater than if we just did this search on just one other world. For example, if and that's because when we do the searches on these different planets, in addition to the question of are we alone, they're also answering other questions. So for example, we're, we're going to go look at Mars. We're going to ask, did Mars ever have life? And the spacecraft we're going to use to do that are rovers. This is the Curiosity rover. I was brought to NASA to work on this team on the atmospheric chemistry uh, and, the, and the ancient climate of Mars um, that this rover was studying. And it's basically, you could think of it as almost a geologist or a geochemist that's traversing the, the, the, the landscape of Mars and doing geological and geochemical analyses. And it's found a lot of evidence that there used to be water on the surface of Mars. And actually, you can kind of see that here, these little layers here in this rock, these rocks, those are likely layers that were laid down in an ancient lake bed. And we've got pretty good evidence, both for the, both from like the physical sedimentology of how these layers were deposited, as well as the chemistry that we've looked at in there, those layers that there was standing water on Mars for significant amounts of time. And that means that it might have been habitable. Now, if you wanna know whether it did have life, that's a, another mission that's now on the surface. It's actually the first of a series of missions. This, the one that's there now, which we refer to lovingly as Percy, which is uh, short for perseverance, is collecting samples. It's also kind of like a geologist, but in this case, it's like a geologist that goes out into the field, finds the best rocks or the best samples, that it's going to bring back home to the to, to the lab to study in great detail. Now, now the first step of this is just to find the best samples, and it's got instruments on board to to help determine what the best samples are. It's already got some samples cored out, drilled out from the surface of Mars, and those are now cached. They're, they're sitting there on the surface of Mars, waiting for us to retrieve them. And we're planning to send another suite of missions to go grab those samples, put them in a rocket, launch them back into space and eventually bring them home to Earth. And the advantage to that is when they come back to Earth, we're not going to be limited. You know, one, one of the things we do when we design these spacecraft is we're limited um, by the mass we can send to another planet, by the volume that we can fit inside a rocket. And that limits the number and the complexity of the science instruments we can bring with us on these rovers and orbiters and telescopes. Well, if we can get the sample and bring it back to Earth, that limitation's gone because that sample it'll will only have a finite amount of it, but we can analyze it with any instrument or any combination of instruments, and it doesn't matter how big they are or how much they weigh because we don't have to launch them into space. They're here on Earth, but it requires us to bring the sample home. And when we do that, we're going to be able to look in detail with laboratories across the world, starting I believe most strongly in the United States, to look for signs of life in those ancient rocks that are now cached on the surface. And when we do that, we're not just going to be answering the question of if Mars has life or not, because if it did have life, we're also going to study the history of that life and how it ended, because we don't think that there's at least widespread life at the surface today. Um, if there is life on Mars today, it's in small environments eking out a living. It certainly isn't widespread. And, and we'd be looking at questions, not just of whether or not there was life on Mars, but how does that life change as the planet loses its surface habitability? We're also planning, as recently announced in the United States Planetary Sciences Decadal Survey, which kind of sets our, our, our path forward for the next decade of space flight and research uh, in the United States. They recently recommended that we send a mission to Enceladus. And we're going to look for life when we send that mission there. And, and it, unlike Mars, we're going to be looking for 
living organisms on Enceladus, actually not on Enceladus, but in Enceladus. We're gonna do this with something called an Orbi lander. It's gonna orbit Enceladus and occasionally land on the surface. And when it does that, it's gonna look for the chemical signatures of life. It's gonna look for it specifically in the material that's being ejected out of Enceladus. There's a, there's a, a, a global ocean underneath an icy exterior shell on Enceladus. And when that water comes out, and falls down to the surface of Enceladus, we would like to take a look at that and see if there's evidence of life in the, the sort of freshly exposed water from the sub ice ocean there. And we answer that question in addition to answering the specific question of is there life on Enceladus and the very broad question of are we alone, it's also gonna be asking this sort of theoretical question of how life works, which is can surface bios, uh, subsurface biospheres exist? Our, our life here on earth is driven by the energy from the sun. Um, and in fact, if you go to the deepest parts of the earth and the deepest parts of our ocean, there does seem to be some connection to this surface biosphere that we have um, from, for example, the organic material that falls out from the life at the surface down to the deeper parts of the planet or the deeper parts of the ocean that can still, still help support the life that exists there. So there's no really good way for us on earth to, to test this idea of a biosphere completely disconnected from the energy source of our, our host star, the sun. And so when we look for life on Enceladus, we're, we're trying to see if you can have that in a way that's fairly or, or, or, or maybe completely disconnected from the, the sun's energy. We also have the possibility, although it's not designed, uh, I'll talk about this in a minute, to look for life on Titan. Certainly in theory going forward, we could look for evidence of life on Titan. Titan is another moon in the outer solar system. Uh, in Titan's case, there's not liquid water at the surface, but there are lakes there. The lakes are made of organic uh, compounds, ethane and, and other organics, and methane and other organic materials. We're planning to send another type of spacecraft, so actually a new type of spacecraft, um, a hovercraft. It's got these eight propeller blades on it, four uh, uh, on two, two, two layers for eight total. Um, went forward a couple. And it's going to be able to fly around Titan, land occasionally, and again do uh, some chemical and mineralogical and geological assessments every time it lands. Now, what it actually has a very similar set of instruments to the ones I described earlier for the for the rovers that are on Mars. They're actually modeled after those instrumentation to a large extent. Now, we this mission isn't planning to look for signs of life. It's just looking at the chemical and mineral mineralogical properties of Titan. But there is a chance there's a there's a I'm, I'm not counting on it, but there's a chance that there could be life on Titan and that this rover or this this helicopter could detect some signs of some odd chemistry that's hard to explain without invoking biology. And if it does, if it does find those this evidence or if subsequent missions to Titan do find evidence of life on Titan in the absence of water, it would be answering this other question, which is like, is weird life of it? Right. Can you have life? Uh, especially on a planetary scale that doesn't require liquid water at the surface. Can you do it, you know, if it's a, if it's an organic based solvent instead of a water based solvent. And then beyond the searches for life, we also do a lot with astrobiology, looking at habitability, not just in a specific sense, but also in an evolutionary sense. How does habitability evolve over time on a planet? I talked a little bit about that on Mars, how it had had surface liquid water before and now it does not. It's also possible our other neighbor, Venus, once had surface global oceans. Um, we don't know, actually, if it did or not. There are some uh, chemical indicators in Venus's atmosphere that strongly suggest it had a lot more water in the past and that it lost a lot of water. But we don't know what form that water was in. We don't know if it was condensed at the surface in an ocean that could support life. And we've got two missions, Veritas on the left, which is an orbiter, and Da Vinci on the right, which is a, a probe that's going to fall through the atmosphere of Venus. Um, those two missions together, especially together with what they'll we'll find out by flying both of them, uh, they're going to probe the history of Venus by looking at chemical tracers of ancient processes that can help us understand if Venus once did have liquid water at the surface. And so when we do that study, we're really looking at whether or not a planet can lose its oceans. Um, and what implications that has for exoplanets, which is where I'll spend most of the rest of this talk thinking about, do exoplanets have life? Um, and, and when we think about that, the tool we use, the spacecraft we use, is a space telescope. We actually can do this with ground-based telescopes as well, although for various reasons, it's going to be easier to do it from space, not the least of which 
is if you've got a ground-based telescope, you're looking through an atmosphere of a planet that has a lot of life, right? You're looking through our atmosphere and the biosignatures that are already prevalent here. Um, and it's easier if you can kind of get rid of that contamination in a sense. I mean, I'm not, I'm not upset that, that those gases are there because they help support us as individuals, but from a life search standpoint, they, they're a contaminant in a sense. Um, so it, it makes sense to get up into space and send a telescope up there. Um, the picture here is uh, two of my favorite things. Um, my most favorite thing, which is my daughter down here at the bottom of the screen, who uh, when she, when she was, uh, oh, my, my mouse is skipping us around. I apologize. Um, when she was a, a, a student at uh, the daycare facility at NASA, had the opportunity to see uh, the telescope, uh, which is in there in the background. Um, and, and she called this the spaceship telescope. That was, that was her nickname for it. Now it's obviously not there anymore. This is the, the, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is now in space. We're checking out its performance now. It's doing wonderfully. Uh, I, I, I'll get to this in a little bit. Now, I have to tell you that, that that telescope wasn't designed to search for life. It wasn't really even designed to do exoplanet um, science because we didn't know that exoplanets, especially we didn't have confirmation that exoplanets that could harbor global biospheres existed when we designed J that, that telescope. But now we know that those planets exist. And I'll get to this in a little bit. We actually know they're quite common. And because we know they're common, we can design a, a, a new telescope that whose main driving science requirements is to determine if life is present on exoplanets. To put it another way, um, this is an experiment designed to test the hypothesis that life exists on planets around other stars. It's called Louvoir. I'll get to that later. So when we do that search for, plant, for life on planets around other stars, on exoplanets, in addition to looking for the life on those specific worlds, the general question we're, we're trying to answer is, do global biospheres exist beyond Earth? Is it possible or, or is it common, I should say, is it common for the kinds of life that we have here in our world um, at the surface, spread across the surface? Is that common in, the, in, in at least our local part of the universe? Now, before I talk about that, I want to just give a, a, a real quick history on what we've learned about exoplanets just in my lifetime. I mean, literally since in, in the 25 years or so since I graduated high school. Um, 20 years since I graduated high school. So I've got a chart here. And what the chart shows is the planet size on the y-axis. So as you go up, it's bigger stuff. And um, my mouse is super sensitive. I'm so sorry. Uh, and energy from the star on the x-axis. And on the x-axis, what it's doing is it's going from um, increasing energy from the star from right to left. And the reason I did it that way is on the left side of the screen is often where we put the sun when we're doing uh, models of the solar system. So just think of the sun being on the left side of this diagram. And you can plot the planets in our solar system on this chart. I, I, I do think Pluto's a planet. That's a probably separate talk, separate discussion. Um, but the planets in our solar system are, are put here for scale and for reference. Um, and when we think about whether or not there's life on other worlds, I want to go back to that discussion of water. Our, the first place we want to look, not the last, but the first place we want to look for the planets that have a lot of life that we a we could recognize, and b uh, uh, that's kind of vigorous enough, and and productive enough to give a big enough signal for us to detect it um, on planets around other stars from far away with just a telescope, not a rover, not a lander, not an orbiter, just with a telescope here looking across interstellar space. And so to do that, what we're really looking for are robust global biospheres, um, ones that are teeming with life. Basically, what that means for us is we want to look for planets that have global oceans of water at the surface, because um, that'll give a lot of um, a, a habitable space for the life to live, and it'll put that life in direct contact with, first of all, the energy from its host star to, to fuel that life, and B, to put it in direct contact with the atmosphere so that whatever gases that life produces can be um, in the part of the planet, the atmosphere, that we can most easily see with the telescope. And this is the idea behind the habitable zone. The habitable zone isn't supposed to be this theoretical hypothesis of the only places that life can exist. It's really the places around a star that global biospheres at the surface that are fueled by water could exist. And, and, and we're interested in those, not because they're the only places that could have life, but because they're the best places we could detect life, the easiest biospheres for us to detect with a space-based telescope. 
So the, the habitable zone is defined by liquid water oceans at the surface where we where those are possible. I and mean, you can be too hot. If you're too hot, you could turn into Venus and you could boil those oceans away. If you're too cold, um, you could, well, actually, Mars isn't really too cold. Mars is too small. It's a different story. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But if you are too cold, you could freeze those oceans. And if you don't end up like Mars, you might end up like Europa or Enceladus or one of those icy ocean worlds in the outer solar system, which might have a lot of water. Um, but that water is going to be locked up in a subsurface and not in direct communication with that planet's atmosphere. You can be too small. Um, for example, the moon, our moon, has just as much energy from the sun as we do. It's in the same orbit around the sun that we're in. Um, so the moon's not too hot or too cold in terms of its orbiting distance. The problem with the moon is it's too small. And because it's so small, it cannot hold onto an atmosphere. And if it can't hold onto an atmosphere, you can't keep the pressure from the atmosphere on that water. And then the water can't stay in an ocean form. In fact, it just escapes out to space and you lose all the water entirely. On the flip side, you can be too big. The planet is too massive. Um, it actually condenses everything around it, including lots of gas like hydrogen. And that puts too much pressure on the water and it doesn't stay liquid. It goes into a supercritical phase. And that would also be bad for life. So if you aren't too big or too small and you're not too hot or you're not too cold, you're in the Goldilocks zone, you're in the, the habitable zone. And that's what this box is meant to be. And again, it's not the only places life could exist. It's just the places that we plan to look for life first. Now I'm going to add some data to this beyond the solar system. Um, as of 1996, the open circles all at the top of the diagram here, um, these are the planets that we knew of beyond other stars. They were all gas giants. They were the same mass as Jupiter and Saturn or thereabouts within a few a factor of two or three of, of the, the masses of the gas giants in our solar system. But they were all very warm or very hot. Um, that was actually surprising. We didn't expect planets, we didn't think actually planets this hot and this big could exist because we don't have those in our solar system. It was, a, it, was, it was such a big surprise that scientists actually didn't believe the first exoplanet discoveries. They were they were met with in, incredible cynicism and skepticism. And those discoveries were eventually um, shown to be true and held up to be confirmed exoplanets. Um, but there was confusion at first because the first planets we discovered were so foreign to our expectations um, that we didn't recognize them as such or didn't believe them as such. So that was 1996. It's now 2022, but by 2016, this was the data set we had. I mean, just in 20 years, we went from a handful of, of planets that were only masses of Jupiter and Saturn or, or maybe larger to hundreds, actually thousands of planets including a few that are in that precious real estate of the habitable zone. And if you fast forward to 2020, this is filled up even more. And if you go forward and think about, I've, I've actually stopped updating this because at this point, we basically found almost every kind of planet that there is. Um, it's a little bit empty down here in the lower right, um, but that's because of the sensitivity of the instruments um, are biased toward planets closer in and planets that are larger. Um, we do have plans for the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope. It's actually going to have biases towards planets further away. So, so by the end of this decade, this, this whole diagram is just going to be full of circles. Now, this has done a few things. It's, it's changed, for me, at a human level, how I look at the night sky. Um, because all of the, well, all of the, a lot of the planets that, were, that I just showed on that last slide, not all of them, but a, a large number of them just came from Kepler. Um, which found thousands of worlds. And, and, and the worlds Kepler found were in this field of view on the, on the map near the, near the Lyra and Cygnus uh, constellations. Now, you don't have to know exactly where they are. There's nothing particularly special about the stars there, except for you know, their relative brightness and how easy it was to observe them. But there's nothing about those stars that make them more or less likely to hold life or uh, harbor, harbor biospheres on the planets around them than the other stars or, or, or areas of the sky. And what I recommend that you do with just friends is go out and put your, this, this patch of sky is about the size of your hand outstretched. And, and, and Kepler discovered thousands of planets uh, in that field. So if you just go out into the, to, to the night um, and put your hand up against the sky, just think that there's literally thousands of worlds um, behind in the stars that are behind your hand. Um, the other way to think about this is, and, and I live in, I said I live just outside Washington, D.C. I get a lot of light pollution here. You can't do a lot of amateur astronomy, but I can do this. You can go out and count the stars in the sky. Because we have found so many planets, we now know that on average, there's at least 
one planet for every star in the sky and probably more. So if you go out and you count stars, you're also counting planets. That wasn't true when I was a kid learning the constellations names. It's true now. Another thing that's true is we found so many, not just planets, but planets that are in that precious Goldilocks zone that we now have a guess at how common those kinds of worlds are. And we argue, you know, the, the, the, the, the most estimates have it to be about around one in 10 stars. Some people say one in three, some people say one in 20, but we know it's not one in a hundred. We know it's not one in a thousand. We've ruled out that those kinds of planets are exceedingly rare. Um, and we also ruled out that they're present around every single star. We know they're on, they're on, you know, like about a tenth to a third of the, of the stars out there, which also means that when you're counting stars, you're not just counting planets, you're counting potentially habitable worlds. You go out into the night sky and you see 10 stars, you've probably got about 10 planets and about one or two planets that have the conditions that could harbor not just life, but, but global biospheres. Um, and that's, that's something any of us can do. You don't need to have a telescope and you don't need to have a dark sky. You can just go out and count the stars. And, and for me, this has changed the way I, I look at the night sky. I, mean, I got interested in these questions because my brother and I were sitting outside when we were high schooler, high schoolers and college students. And he, he asked me, are we alone? And I thought, gosh, I don't know. It seems like a difficult question and one that's worth um, you know, spending my life working on. Um, but but we, had, we had no data on it. And we still don't have any data on whether or not life is out there. But today we have lots of data on how common planets are and especially on, and specifically on, on how common planets are that have conditions that would allow for global biospheres. Now that experiment was designed, um, the Kepler mission um, was designed to find those worlds in the habitable zone. But it didn't just find those worlds. It found a huge diversity of planets in terms of their sizes, in terms of their orbits around their stars. And, and, and, and that has given us a tremendous amount of information on how planets form and how their orbits and sizes come to be the orbits and the sizes that they are. And this is a, a, an awesome chart of the planets that were found. Can, excuse me, I don't think this is complete. This is as of a certain date. The solar system is shown here kind of in the middle right of the diagram to scale. You can see the orbits of the planets in our solar system. And each one of these other sort of orbital diagrams is a separate planetary system that Kepler has found. And you can see some of these are huge, bigger than anything we've got in our solar system. And some of them are, are actually all of them are much closer to their host star um, than the planets in our solar system are to its host star. That was partially because of the observational biases that Kepler had. But what was interesting about this was the diversity of things that we found and how much further they went than our expectations. One example I'd give is on the left, um, we've got this HD 40307G. Um, uh, planet, which wasn't discovered by, by Kepler, but it's an example of the exoplanets we've found so far. It's often referred to as a super Earth or a sub Neptune. It's got a mass, a size bigger than our planet, but smaller than the gas giants in our outer solar system. Now, before we flew these missions, before we did built the space, the, the ground based telescopes to look for these planets, we did not think these planets were common. And we had physical models that reproduced our solar system. Um, and the masses and the orbits that we have in our solar system. And those models did not predict that super Earths or sub Neptune planets would form. They, they, they predicted that those planets would be rare because that's what that they, were, they were designed to reproduce our solar system. Well, <laughs> not only do we find those planets, not only were they not rare, they're some of the most common worlds out there. Um, and as a result of that knowledge, we've now changed our models because we had new data we had our models had to capture and reproduce. And now our models can explain why those planets exist, first of all. But second of all, the new models explain the history of our solar system, our home planetary system better. Um, we now can explain why Mars has the orbit and the size that it does better than we did before we found these other worlds that broke our models, which we then had to fix. And in fixing them, our models improved in other ways as well. And they, we understand home better because of the things we found beyond our home planetary system. And the other example I love is Kepler 16b. The astrophysicist said, you can't have a planet orbiting around a double star system where the two stars are orbiting each other and the planet is orbiting around the two stars. If you, if you did have a planet like that, it'd be poetic because you'd have someone being able to look up on the horizon and see this beautiful double sunset. The astronomer said, no, it's, our physical models say that's impossible. It won't be dynamically stable. The planet will be ejected from the system. Don't bother looking for those. 
Now, I, I have to tell you, I knew those things existed, but it's not because I was, you know, smarter or better than the, the astronomers. I was just, I was using a different literature source, which was, I was a kid uh, watching Star Wars. And, you know, you, you, you think about Luke or now Ray looking up at the double sunset um, and Anakin uh, before the two of them in the storyline, at least. Um, and, and I knew that those were out there. Um, but it wasn't because of any knowledge I had of astronomy. It's just because I, I, I, I was following the visions of George Lucas and all the wonderful people that worked on these movies. Um, and it makes me think about what other things that we're planning to look for. Um, how can those surprise us when we look for life beyond Earth? Okay, so now I'm onto the search for life beyond Earth. And I'm going to start with the Trappist system, which made big news <clears throat> a few years ago. And the reason it was so exciting to astronomers is at that point, we were planning to launch this new space telescope. Um, and if you had asked me five years ago if our telescopes that we were planning to launch could, especially the JWST telescope, if, you're, if you asked me five years ago, six years ago, can that telescope, will it be able to find signs of life? I would have said, well, in theory, yeah, it, it, it, it could, but you need kind of perfect systems to be able to do that. So I'm not counting on it. Well, um, this system, the TRAPPIST system, which we found um, about five years ago, um, it's a pretty much a perfect system for us to observe. Um, it, it, it's got a bunch of planets close to that star. A, a few of those planets in the middle here are in the, the habitable zone, so that they have the po po possibility to harbor global, global biospheres. And the star itself is bright enough and close enough to Earth where it's going to give us a big enough signal for, for the James Webb Space Telescope to be able to look at it and, and, and get some decent data on the planets around those stars. JWST is in space now. Um, fast forward five years to today. <clears throat> it's not just in space. It is operating fantastically. Um, I, I just, I'm not working on this mission, but a few of my colleagues and friends are. I just saw um, data from Jane Rigby, Rigby, my close friend, and Lee, Lee Feinberg, my, my colleague on the, on the engineering side. Um, and, and they showed me us these data of how well it's performing. And, and I, I am, I'm a scientist. I don't often get emotional looking at data, but when they showed me how, and showed us, showed, showed a, a, a, the audience, I was in how just spectacularly this telescope is performing. It brought tears to my eyes because um, both because it indicates the successful work that they did. I mean, the people that worked on this telescope, they've been working on it their whole careers. And I was proud for them, I was happy for them that the thing they invested their careers in was successful. I was excited for the near-term data because it's going to have a, a chance to look for signs of life on other worlds. I'll get to that in a minute. Because it's performing so well um, and because we were lucky to find those traffic systems. And I'll get to this in a bit too. It also shows that we can build really complex telescopes and we, we're developing the technologies we need to develop even more complex ones that could search for life with a design uh, approach. Now, I do have one other, well, two other concerns about JWST being able to find life on other worlds. One of them is um, the, J, the way that JWST is going to do it is it's going to wait for these planets to pass in front of their host stars. And when the planet passes in front of the host star, it's going to take a spectrum of that planet. Look at how much light of each wavelength of light is coming into the telescope. And the idea is that the light that the telescope sees when the planet is in front of the star is going to pass through the planet's atmosphere, <clears throat> almost like if you've got a color filter up against a light in an auditorium. Uh, it changes the color of the light. Same thing would happen here. If you've got the planet in front of the star, the light that passes through the planet's atmosphere is going to be filtered by the atmosphere and the colors of light are going to change. By looking at the colors of light and how they're changed, we can look for certain gases in the planet's atmosphere. And by looking for that, we'll be able to look for signs of life. Now, I'm skeptical for two reasons. One is observational. When you do the observation at that angle, the, the ability of the atmosphere to block the light, especially um, the, it is, is pretty strong. But that can be a downside because the, the light doesn't really get down to the lower parts of the atmosphere where the life exists and where a lot of the gases exist that could harbor life or that, that come from life. And that's particularly true if you've got clouds. If you've got clouds, they really kind of block the light from getting into the lower parts of the atmosphere where the signals of life are, are just more abundant. So that's one issue. And, and it's gonna prevent us from looking for 
life like we've got on modern day Earth. If, if, if we looked at, at Earth with JWST, we probably would not recognize the life on modern day Earth. Um, it, we might be able to look for life like it used to exist on Earth. Because I, I like to tell people Earth is more than one planet. Um, if you got in a time machine and went back 3 billion years into Earth's history, you would have found life there. Um, well, you would have found life if you also brought a gas mask with you with oxygen, an oxygen tank attached. <clears throat> and the reason you would have needed an oxygen tank attached is there was not a, a, enough oxygen in Earth's early atmosphere for us to breathe, even after life originated on the planet. There was a teeming biosphere, global and at the surface, but it was making methane uh, predominantly, not oxygen as the algae and plants do on our, our current world. And, I, and we have tremendous data on this in the rock record that both that life existed and that oxygen wasn't around. And so that tells us, and I, and I like to tell people like th th th that, that ancient earth, it's the most alien biosphere that we have data for because the chemistry would have been different. The atmosphere chemistry would have been different. The climate would have been different. The, the, the colors of the rocks would have been different. Um, it would have really seemed like a truly alien world, but one inhabited by life. Now that methane that life produced instead of oxygen, we, we, if we were going to look for life on modern day earth, we'd be, we'd be looking for that oxygen. I, I'll talk about that later. But the fact that the life was making the methane, that methane would have been detectable. And it actually would have been detectable in two ways. One is it would have had its own signatures from the methane we could look for in the atmosphere. And it also would have made this sort of of haze that would have made the planet orange or tangerine in color, um, as you're seeing in this artist's rendering of what Earth used to look like. And so we can look for the signs of the methane, the signs of that haze existing, and try to constrain the sources of that methane to see if they were biological or non-biological. So, so JWST has the potential to look for this kind of biosphere, in part because that haze would have gotten up above the cloud layers, and, and, and the methane would have as well. And it would have, it, we have the possibility to see a biosphere, not like the one we have today, but the one we used to have on Earth billions of years ago. Now, the other issue, the other challenge, I should say, with looking for life with JWST is the planets and the stars that it's going to look for, that it's going to characterize, um, are all, uh, uh, they, they're all for host stars, where the stars are smaller than the sun, cooler than the sun, and have a greater percentage of their energy coming out in this high energy radiation phase. I, I, I, I like to make the analogy with, as a parent, as a dad, I like to make the analogy with toddlers. They're around these M type stars and M stars are the, the toddlers of, of the universe because um, they're small and, and each one is unique and different than the other. Um, and, and they're really uh, chaotic and it's sometimes they flare up in big temper tantrums. And, and they can calm down again. And, and you know what? I have temper tantrums too. Um, but the difference to me between like an adult, which would be like a, a, a, a solar type star and, an, a, and a toddler, which is like an M type star, is the toddlers, they, they flare up. They have those, those, those fits a lot more often. Um, that's what happens on the M stars. They have those flare ups all the time. Um, and as a result, that high energy radiation, as it, when, it, when it hits the planet, it can be really damaging, not just to the life that exists on the planet, but also to the ability, the ability of the planet to hold onto the atmosphere. That that that energy got so much, the, the photons have so much energy to them. They could literally strip away the atmosphere and then the water that exists on the planet as well. And then you'd even if the biology could survive that energy bombardment, it's not going to survive the escape of the atmosphere on the oceans to space. Now I I don't know. I mean this is the thing. This is why we do science, right? Like I. I am skeptical that these planets have life for that reason, but this is why we do the experiment, right? What I just told you, what I think is probably going on there, that's a hypothesis. And what's cool about the moment we're in is we've got an experiment that can test that hypothesis I just put out there. And that's what, J at the very least, JWST is going to be able to do that. Say, like, have these planets had their atmospheres blown away by their toddler active M type stars? Or do they retain their atmospheres and potentially water? And if they do retain their atmospheres, do they have signs of life like it used to exist on Earth? Now, if you want to look for modern day Earth-like life or, or for life across the history of Earth and for other kinds of life that might exist on, on ocean-bearing worlds, we're going to need a different imaging technique. We want to see below that cloud layer. And to do that, instead of waiting for the planet to pass in front of the star, we want to get a picture of the planet itself. 
Now we can do this. This is actually real data I'm showing you. This is a movie of planets moving around another star, which is like every time I see this it blows my mind. Um, now these planets, they're not Earth-like. They're, they're bigger than Earth. They're actually much hotter than Earth. Um, they're much further away from their host star than Earth is, and the, the star itself is different than, than our star. But this technique can see planets. And what we need to do is we need to advance this technique and put it on a capable enough telescope to not just take pictures of big, hot, far away worlds that are, that are, that are, way, that, that are very distant from their host star, but to those planets in the habitable zone I was talking about before. And we've designed an experiment to do just that, to get, to get these pale blue dots around other stars. It's called the Louvoir, or the HabX telescope, which I'll, I'll talk about a little. Uh, uh, uh, uh, it's, the, it's the telescope I showed earlier, actually. I don't think I've got another slide on it now. And we've designed an experiment now, the, the, these telescopes, to take these pictures of these stars. Now, this is a picture of our Earth taken from the outer solar system with the Cassini spacecraft. Um, Carl Sagan referred to this as the pale blue dot. He was very poetic about it, right, about all the people we knew um, coming from uh, that have ever lived on our planet, all the species that have ever lived on our planet lived on that on one pale blue dot. It was very poetic. Now, as a scientist and as the engineers that we're working with, the challenge is how do we turn that one pale blue dot and get enough information from it to find out whether or not it has life? And the answer, I talked about this a little bit before, is we take that one pale blue dot and we spread it into a spectrum where we're looking at how much light is coming into the telescope at every wavelength of light. And we can look for signs of vegetation there. If we're looking in the visible, we can look for signs of carbon dioxide and methane and water vapor and oxygen, the gas we're breathing that was made by algae or ozone. Um, and I, I talked about this before. It was kind of a hidden nugget, a preview of what was to come. We can look for signs of life remotely and detect it, right? When we were doing the CWIFs imaging that I was talking about earlier, this was a remote observation. This wasn't a bunch of drones and, and, and rovers flying and driving and swimming around, or this was us looking back down at our home world and seeing the, the life there from the pigments and the foliage on the surface and in the sea. And not just that, we can also see the things that life is doing to our atmosphere. Um, this is a map of the carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere, again, from a, an Earth sciences mission from NASA, looking back down on Earth, and we can see the carbon dioxide. And I use that um, both because it's, it is, in theory, made by life. I mean, we're breathing it out right now. Um, it's not a great biosignature because there's lots of non-biological sources of it, but it, it, it, it's honestly the prettiest, the prettiest of the gases that I could have these kind of uh, visual maps of. We can also look for ozone from space back on Earth or methane or oxygen. We can look for water. Um, we can look for all these gases. And, and, and that tells us that we can also look for them on other worlds if we design the telescope to find it. Now, if we did, if we did find the, the, the gases that light produces, if we did see evidence of some pigments on the surface, um, well, first of all, I'd be pretty excited. I'd be ready to pop a bottle of champagne and I'm not a champagne drinker. Um, and maybe plan my retirement and and and and call it a win. But I, I have to point something out, which is once we find the things we think are life, the story doesn't end there. That's just the start. Um, this is an image from the Allen Hills meteorite. This is a a piece of Mars that got blasted off the surface of Mars, flew uh, a few orbits around the sun, and eventually crashed in Antarct in, in Antarctica on Earth. And when it did so, um, actually years later, <clears throat> scientists found it. Uh, brought it back to some NASA labs. They looked at that meteorite, which had originated on Mars, and found these little things that looked like fossils. And they found chemical signatures of life in the same rock. And they had a press conference. And they announced that they had found evidence of past life on Mars. You fast forward to today, and I don't think that we have evidence of life on Mars, um, not in this rock. It's possible that that stuff was made by life. Um, but I'm not convinced that it was. Um, and I'm going to fast forward through a few slides here just to speed things up a little bit. Um, apologies. Um, this is just saying that we can look for the life that we've had throughout Earth history. <coughs> um, that's not the first time we've announced that we found evidence of life beyond Earth, or even the first time we've announced life on Mars. I apologize, this is a little grainy. Um, this is a, an old figure I, I, I photocopied and put into my slide deck. This is data from the Viking lander that, that was on Mars in the 1960s, um, 60 years ago now. And 
what this was measuring is it had a little specific experiment designed to look for life on, on the Martian surface. And, and it, it had this, these nutrients and the nutrients had some, uh, were radioactively labeled and they took a little bit of Martian soil and they went and they went and looked to see if um, there was, a, a, they, they, they, they inoculated it. They gave it a little bit of water, gave it a little bit of nutrients and they had a hypothesis. If you give the Martian soil water and nutrients, then it will really, it'll use up the nutrients and it'll release the radioactively labeled nutrients into the gas chamber, the, the, the, the, the gas cell, and then we'll be able to see the, an increase in radioactivity. And, and, and that was what they said they would see if there was life in the Martian soil. <clears throat> and sure enough, that's exactly what they saw. As soon as they put the nutrients into the, into the, into the experiment, they saw gas in the gas cell uh, ticking up in radioactivity, just as they predicted would happen if life was there. Now, it's possible that that was from life. However, um, we now know that it's also quite possible, if not likely, um, that this was just organics that were sitting in the soil um, that, that helped fuel some reaction that caused those nutrients. Um, to bake off and, and, and be released into the gas cell without any biology being involved in that process. And so both in this case and in the other case of the fossil microbes that were on the meteorite, there was an idea for what they wanted to look for, the prior scientific teams, and they found it. And they weren't bad ideas and they weren't bad scientists. But what happened afterwards is a bunch of other people got involved and they said, hey, you know what, there's another way to explain this data set. And they did their own lab experiments. They did their own research into the data that came from those, those prior studies. And they came up with a compelling way to describe the data without invoking biology. Um, and unless you think I'm picking on people that have done research on Mars, this has also happened a lot in our search for the earliest life on Earth. It's actually, when I look back in the literature, it's one of the most contentious uh, debates pop popping up again and again and again, which is what's the oldest evidence of life on earth. And every time someone makes a claim like that, in general, I, I put up some fossils here that were, that were vigorously disputed. Um, this is the earliest fossil, fossil evidence of life on earth, according to the original authors in 1993, Bill Schaaf et al. Um, there was a huge debate. I mean, name calling, they were, they were calling these things pseudo fossils because they, the, the people that, that, that, that rejected that claim that these were the earliest fossils on Earth found other ways to make the structures um, that were claimed to be evidence of life. And you see this popping up pretty much anytime anyone announces a discovery of life uh, elsewhere. We've seen it recently with announcements of the potential for life on Venus in, in the, the, the potential detection of phosphine in its atmosphere. So everywhere we look for life, every time we've looked for life, including here on Earth when we were looking for the earliest life on Earth, Finding what we propose to be signs of life, is it, it's actually easy. We've done it a number of times. The hard part and the true test of these searches for life will be explaining, or I should say discriminating between the biology and the non-biological processes that could create the same data set. And to do that right, you need to know the context. To go back to that Martian meteorite, if you knew the con if we know the context of that that meteorite and its history well enough, we can understand whether or not the non-biological processes were possible or wh whether they would have led to the signatures we see. That also tells us whether or not the biology is a plausible thing. It's one of the things that people are skeptical about with the claims for life on Venus. Not that it's impossible, but there are challenges to life on Venus, which make that context makes the biological uh, explanation for the data less likely than if the if the environment was quite friendly to life. Now, the telescope I was mentioning before, which I, I, it's the LUVAR study, that's the logo on the top right. Um, we've designed from the get go to think about some alternate explanations of the data. We've got uh, models, including papers I've written on how you can make oxygen or ozone in a planetary uh, atmosphere without biology. I talked about methane before. We know there's planets in our own solar system that have methane that don't have biology. So we know that there's non-biological processes that can make the gases that life produces. But what's key is to know how those gases are made and to see if you can find evidence of the presence of those processes or, or ways to uh, data that could rule out those processes. For example, uh, we know that, that you can make oxygen and ozone in a planetary atmosphere if you've got a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and if you've got a lot of 
ultraviolet radiation from the star that could drive certain photochemical reactions that could turn that carbon dioxide, the oxygen atoms in the carbon dioxide into uh, uh, uh, O2 and O3, oxygen and ozone. So what does that mean? It means you want to look for carbon dioxide, and it means you want to characterize the host star. Um, and it also means you want to know the mass of the atmosphere and its surface properties. Um, all of these things have been included in one package, which is this telescope that we're planning to start building later this decade, or I should say we're going to start as a project designing later this decade called Louvoir or Habax, or we'll actually have a new name at some point, but this is the, the version that we studied. It's going to be able to find those signs of life, but it's also going to be able to look at that life in the context of the size of the planet, the orbit of the planet, and the ultraviolet radiation from the host star. We've got instruments that specifically do all of those things. So it gives us that context. Now, again, that won't be the end of the story either, because I want to just fast forward. And, that, and just so you all know, like my, my personal ambition, my plan the rest of my career is to be a part of that team that builds that telescope that is designed from the get-go to detect signs of life on planets around other stars um, and to rule out the known ways that non-biological processes could make those signs of life. Now, there's two other um, things that are going to happen, right? First is we got to build it. And for I know we got a lot of students in the audience. Um, there's a lot of time for you all to uh, uh, advance your careers and your professional reputation and become a part of this mission, because we haven't even started this one as a formal project yet. Um, and when we do start it as a formal project, it's probably going to take a decade or two to build it. So we're not talking about launching this next year or even five years from now. We're talking about launching this a decade or two from now, right? We're talking about launching it in around 2040. Um, and, and that means, oh, that's my timer. I'm almost done, I've got a couple slides left. Um, and, and that means that all of you have, have time to, to advance your careers to, to the point where you could be a part of that mission or that team or, or an independent researcher that's looking at the data that are coming back from that mission. That's step one. Step two, and I said this before, is all of this, whether we're talking about the search for life on Enceladus or Mars or on exoplanets, it's really just the start. Um, because even if we found a planet that had oxygen and methane and ozone and water, and it had the UV properties of the star and the carbon dioxide concentration for which the known ways to make uh, those, those gases together were ruled out, I would be very confident that we found life on that world personally. However, I also expect there to be grad students or postdocs or other scientists out there that come up with other explanations for the data. No matter how strong our claims are, um, someone, I think, is going to come up with an alternate explanation for the data that we find. And the true test for any scientific idea, especially revolutionary ones, right, ones that will change our vision of, of, of who we are and our place in the cosmos, those most revolutionary ideas are going to, and they should have pushback in the form of alternate explanations for the data. And the true test for those ideas will be whether they stand the test of time, whether when we do a follow-up experiment, the follow-up experiment either confirms the original conclusions or confirms the, the, the alternate explanations for that original data set. And this is part of why part of why I, I, I think this needs to be an international endeavor. The, the missions I've been talking about today are NASA led, um, not NASA done on their own. These are things that are inherently gonna be international collaborations, even at the individual mission level, and certainly at the level of international scientists coming on board and looking at the data as individuals from across the globe and, and together as a global community. And it should be that way, because we're talking about us as a human species, as, a, as, a, as, a, as inhabitants of a common biosphere and planet. Um, but there's another way that this is going to need to be international, which is um, NASA is not going to be able to, on its own, fly all the missions that it needs to to do this search everywhere it needs to happen, and then to fly the follow-up missions to confirm the original claims and, and the counterclaims that arise from it. And I, I have an example here, which is the LIFE telescope, the large uh, interferometer for exoplanets, which is also designed to be able to look for biosignatures. Now, the difference is LIFE has a different way to block out the, the light from the host star, but it's looking at a different set of wavelengths from Ouvoir and Habex and the missions that I hope to be a part of that are NASA-led. LIFE is being um, studied in Europe as a potential mission for the European Space Agency. And if we did either one of those missions and they found signs of life, 
there'd be predictions for what the other mission would see if the life was really there. And there'd be predictions of what that other mission would see if the life was not there and those data were created by non-biological processes that gave us a false positive. And for me, this is so exciting, right? Not because as a scientist, this goes back to the beginning of my talk. As a scientist, what I'm expecting is not that we fly one mission and answer the question of are we alone? The exciting thing to me is that we're at a moment in our species history where we start the endeavor of applying the scientific method with specific purpose-built instruments and experiments to start the search for life beyond Earth and start to directly address those questions. And that, and to do it in a systematic way across and beyond the solar system. And that's exciting just in and of itself, but it's also exciting for another reason. I wanna take you back just for one moment to what I talked about when we, when we flew the Kepler mission. And when we looked for exoplanets, I told you we had models. We had both mental models and numerical models for how planets get the orbits and the sizes that they end up with. And it was all based on our solar system. The, to, to reproduce the one data point we had. Um, and those models reproduced the data that we had from our solar system, but they were terrible <laughs> at reproducing. I shouldn't say terrible. They had a lot of flaws and they didn't capture everything that was out there, um, especially the things that were very different from what we have in our solar system in terms of planet orbits and sizes. And what did capture some of that <laughs> was the science fiction community that had different ideas of what was possible. And so when I think about this and I think about what we have on earth and our models for, and, and really in the solar system and the models for why life exists on earth in a global way, why it doesn't exist on the other planets in our solar system, at least at the surface in a global way. And then I think about, well, we're gonna look for this on all these other worlds in and beyond the solar system with this mental model in mind and with numerical models that have arisen from that mental model based on, again, that one data point. I mix, a lot of people ask me like, well, what if we, we're all wrong? Because it's all based on the, the life we have on Earth. I'm actually excited by that, right? Because we're probably going to be wrong, right? We have to go into this expecting for our ideas, our hypotheses, our mental and numerical models to be incomplete at best. But until they fail, we won't know how they're incomplete. And in some ways, what excites me as a scientist is for our hypotheses, our ideas, our plans to not succeed because it's in the lack of success that things are revolution. Now, it's also possible that we got it all right, right? If we got it all right, then we're probably going to find some biosignatures out there, the specific ones that we're planning to search for. And that's also a revolutionary idea. But I focus on this because no matter what, whether we design the search correctly or incorrectly, we're going to learn a lot more um, about our place in the cosmos and how common life is and about how biospheres interact with their host planets. Um, and, I, and I'm looking forward to the lessons we learn for ourselves on how to live on a globally inhabited biosphere here at home. Um, I'll stop there and I'll just I'll end with this, which is we've revolutionized the way I should, and I say we, I wasn't a part of this, this is colleagues, we scientists, we, the global community, have revolutionized the way that I look at the night sky already once in my lifetime. And I have a lot of hope and, and I have good reason to believe that we're going to revolutionize it again before I retire. Um, and I'll stop there and take your questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for this educational presentation. It was really amazing. And I was happy to see that a uh, web telescope mates. I, it was an emotional moment for me when I see those focusing uh, images. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was, I, it, it was um, especially knowing how much people spent their lives on it. It was really yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. yeah. I will read the questions now. Um, a first question, don't you think it would be uh, dangerous to find out that there is a living life somewhere else? After all, we don't know how they will respond back to us. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm of two minds of this. I, um, knowing of their presence does not necessarily mean that they will know that we are there, right? Um, 
And I, I think there will be implications for us as a society when that happens. I'm going to think about this a lot. Like what, what is, what is our response going to be um, as individual people, as a, as a global society to the knowledge that we're not alone? Um, and I should specify, I wasn't clear on this. A lot of the, the searches that I'm talking about doing are for um, global biospheres, not necessarily civilizations. Now, there are people that are planning and are actually doing that. They're looking for not just um, trees and algae and, and, and the like. They're looking for, for in, intelligent, communicating civilizations that are sending signals out or, in, into space in, intentionally. Um, or, or, or sometimes they're looking for the, the byproducts, the waste products of a very powerful civilization. Um, that's a separate talk by, by other folks. I'm not against that. It's just not my area of expertise. Um, I think the other thing I'd point out is just in terms of the relative technologies. I, I, I, this is how I, I, I, I myself, I, I rest easier at night thinking about it this way. Um, it's kind of scary in some ways, but it also is, to me, at least a little comforting. If the if the concern is that the the that there's another civilization out there that's going to find us um, and then come here and do something about our presence here, um, they probably know we're here already. Um, and, and and by that I mean like I just gave this whole talk about technologies that we have today that we're planning to use to build a telescope or or, or spacecraft to look for life in our solar system and and and, and well beyond. So we have the technological capability to find life around other stars. We have that now. We don't have the techno te technological capability to, to like be interstellar bullies and go up like across the, the interstellar space and you know beat up that other civilization because we know they're there. And and the the corollary to that to me is unless the technology developed in some other wildly different order, um, they probably at least know that the life on Earth is here well before they have the ability to come here. So if they have the ability to come here, my guess is they know we're here already. And what, what we do, I, I, I don't think is gonna impact their, their, their knowledge of our existence or not. But I could be wrong. This is just at least what I tell myself <laughs> at, at night. Yeah, maybe you can be right. Oh, okay, the next question is, uh, could an uh, organic life form, e.g. bacteria, microbe transported to the planet for, from vacuum sent to uh, sent to Mars, change the biology of Mars. This is a huge concern we have. Um, there's a there's a whole separate um, field really called planetary protection, um, and they're worried. The people that work on planetary protection are actually worried about this in both directions. Um, Every time we send a, a, a spacecraft anywhere in the solar system, one of the things we have to ask ourselves is, is it landing in a, a, a quote unquote special environment? And the special environment is defined as a, a region that could be habitable um, for Earth-like life. And in, in this case, it's important to specify Earth-like life because what our concern is we could take life from Earth, transport it to this other world, um, and then it could thrive or exist and or thrive on that other world. And that'd be bad for a number of reasons. Um, one, just in the like selfish scientist sense, that would get in the way of our ability to um, look for the life on that other world. Because if you go to do an experiment that looks for life and you just detect the life that you brought with you, you really just contaminated your experiment. Now, I think there's also like a, a higher, like a moral or ethical reason to not do that, which is if there is life on that other world um, and our life kind of, I don't want our life to be like the invasive species that goes and like dominates that world and and and and and eradicates or or out competes or pushes out the life that exists on other, that other world so anytime we send a spacecraft to another world if it's going to a region that earth-like life could exist we have very stringent controls and standards that are that are actually not it's not the united states um own standards we we're responsible for applying those standards to the missions we fly from the space agency from nasa but it's standard standards that are actually set uh, at an international level um, by the international community and all nations are expected to abide by it. Um, so we do it because we want to protect that other world. We also do it if we're bringing samples home because we also don't want the opposite thing to happen. Now we're not, a, we don't think like there's not a theoretical reason to be scared about this. Like there's actually a lot of theoretical reasons to not be worried about this, about going to another world, bringing a sample home 
and having that biology be an invasive species to our world, um, we really don't expect it to happen. However, <laughs> um, we don't, we can't rule it out entirely. And because it could be such a bad thing to have happen, um, we're extra careful when we bring these samples back to make sure that it won't happen. And the MARS sample return plan has specific protocols that are going to be in place for that. And that'll be true anytime we bring samples home. And both of those are planetary protection, which is, it's a different field than astrobiology. Like there's different experts and, and different scientists, but they use a lot of the same tools and we are in a lot of the same meetings and they end up becoming almost like the, the, the security or the like um, the monitors for our missions. Because, you know, astrobiologists, they want to go look for the life. And if the planetary protection people are like, whoa, whoa, whoa, slow down. Like, let's make sure you don't ruin that planet first or our planet for that matter. Um, so that that that is a huge concern. Um, and, and the good thing is I think that the scientific community has rightly recognized it as a big concern and are incorporating it into the, the way they do these missions. Yeah, thank you. What kind of research can scientists do on other planets to predict the worst case scenarios the Earth may face in the future? Oh, I love that question. So um, there's a lot. Um, I think a lot about Venus here. Um, you go back a few decades um, when we were facing other environmental, global environmental problems as a, as a planet and as a, as a civilization, specifically the ozone hole. Um, and some of the chemistry behind why the ozone hole was not just forming, but but how how deep and and big that that hole was becoming, um, there was some unexpected chemistry there. And it's quite complex. It has to do with like things freezing out in extremely cold clouds at the pole, um, and then having those clouds evaporate and and release specific chemicals that participated in these catalytic chemical cycles that rapidly destroy the ozone. It was really complicated. Um, and it wasn't the only reason, but, but, but part of the reason, part of the way we figured that out was by looking at some of the chemistry that was occurring in the atmosphere of Venus. It really gave some support to the people that were looking at the chemistry of Earth that was leading to ozone hole, the, the destruction of the ozone hole. And, and because of that, um, I mean, this is, I, I'd like to tell this story because it's so, as someone that's been a, like, like just to put this in perspective, like I, the, the tools I use for my research, they're, they're all atmospheric models it's, it, it, and they all have their roots in Earth history, right? When I, when I do my research on exoplanets, I'm almost always using a model that was originally to, designed to study an environmental climate problem on Earth, like climate change or the ozone hole. Um, and knowing enough, as much as I do about the physics and the chemistry of, of planetary climate, it's scary. It's really scary. But there's something that gives me hope. Um, which is th that that story about ozone. It wasn't just that we found this stuff on Venus and it helped us explain. It's that the world, the, the, the, the global community got behind doing better. Um, and once we once we put our hearts to it and, and, and put our minds to it, um, um, we really did change our ways and, and succeeded in, in, in not doing the things we were previously doing that were causing ozone hole destruction. Um, I think there's similar things that could happen going forward with climate change. Um, there are some unknowns with climate change, not whether or not it's happening and not whether or not it's caused by humans. It's happening and we are absolutely the, the driver of it. The unknowns are what's going to happen to our planet in response to that. Um, and I think of two ways that, that, that studying these other worlds could help. Um, one is what we're really talking about when we do planetary science and when we do astrobiology is um, looking at the same processes and the same um, uh, the same processes and systems that exist on our planet, atmosphere, chemistry, climate, biology, and looking at them in a at a wildly different planetary context. And when we do that, they're kind of like extreme end members that are way more extreme than anything that is going to happen to our world. Now, the stuff that's going to happen to our planet is not good for us, um, but it's not nearly as severe as extreme. As, as the differences between Earth and these other worlds. So by looking at these other worlds, we, we, we understand the response function better. When you change the climate, what's the resulting impact going to be on Earth? Um, for example, as bad as climate change is going to be, by looking at Venus, we know it's probably not going to cause us to enter a runaway state and end up like Venus. Um, it's good to know. 
Um, another example is when we take our models and we run them for these other worlds and they work, it gives credence and, and it validates the models that we use to predict the climate change. And I've got more confidence in these models because I know they can reproduce not just Earth today and not just Earth 50 or 100 years ago, but Earth a billion years ago or three billion years ago and Venus today and Mars today and Mars a couple billion years ago. Um, I have a lot more faith in those models because they're not overly tuned to just give you an answer that says climate change is real and we're the cause. These models work wherever, whatever planet we plop them in on. Um, so I think it's both of those things. It's trust in the models and learning how the planets respond to the things that we're doing to it by looking at the wider diversity of worlds that are out there. Mm, yeah. Uh, suppose we detect that there is a biological life on an exoplanet, but we cannot see them. What would you expect these creatures to look like? Are there any scientific studies that make such predictions? Um, there, I'm going to give a shout out to my, my, my colleague and my friend. Her name is Nancy Kiang, K-I-A-N-G. Um, she wrote this awesome paper. I, it wasn't even a paper. It was like a popular science article, but it was really science-based. Um, in Scientific American, gosh, it was like 15 years ago, some, some, sometime in the, in the like mid-2000s, maybe late 2000s. Um, and what she did was she, she asked this question of like, why are plants green? Um, like, why are the leaves on trees green? Why are algae green? Um, and she came up with a rationale for, for why evolution on earth would have led to green pigments being the energy uh, preferred color uh, for, for, for pigments to obtain energy from our sun at the surface of our world. And, and it has to do with how much energy you get from the photons. It also has to do with like getting enough to do the, to do oxygenic photosynthesis, but not so much that you cause the plant to overheat. And if you try to balance those two forces on our planet, you get green pigments. It's like, that's kind of the ideal choice. And then she went and she said, all right, well, what if, what if the star is different or what if the atmosphere between the star and the planet is different? and the photons reaching the surface are different, what would that do to the plant life? And she made some predictions, right? And she's like, well, if you're a planet, if you're a bi if there's a biosphere on a planet around like a much cooler star that doesn't have as much of the visible light that comes from our sun, like not as much blue, green, red light, it has more red and less blue. The red light has less energy in its photons. And it actually, those stars actually get a lot more infrared light, but like we can't even see um, those, Photons, each one of them, each individual photon is going to have less energy than the, the, the photons that we get from our host star. So if you're a planet on that star, you probably would do two things. One is you probably get every single one of those photons coming from the star that you can get in the visible region. And instead of being green, those plants might be like black because <laughs> they want to just absorb everything. Um, they also might, because th those are the toddler stars I was talking about before that are really hyperactive and flare up, they also probably have a very strong UV screen to them. That, that's the other thing you'd expect to, to protect them from the ultraviolet radiation. And so if you looked at them with like a UV light, you'd see them like just shining at you in the UV um, to protect themselves. You could also think about other stars and how they impact the color of the foliage uh, on those, those worlds. So we've got some predictions on that. Um, for other things, we don't have a good way to go because we're right now we're at the sort of biosphere level. We're trying to figure out the drivers of, of what's happening at the global level. Um, we have some predictions of things like what would the what would the microbes be doing? What would life be doing on that planet to get energy in that environment? And we we can predict that a little bit, but that's not what the the life would look like. It's more about what would the life do. Um, eventually, and this is this goes back to my thing about this is the first step. If we found these the, this evidence of life on another world around another star, we would design that, those experiments, right? Like we would want a bigger telescope to not just get a single pixel of light light from the, the planet, but to maybe make a map of it and see if there were forests on the surface and what color those forests were. We might send another uh, spacecraft to travel to that world, which would take a long time, but at that point, it might be worth doing um, to, to to to look for look at that life in greater detail. Um, but that's that's probably oof, uh, decades, if not like a, a, a century away. We're, we're a ways away from doing that. But it's possible. We could do it. I, I just don't think it's the first thing we'll do. Okay. Could there be a non-carbon-based way of life? Yes. Yes, there could. Um, 
uh, but I don't know how it would work. <laughs> and this is part of it. I, I mean, I, the part of the reason we we're not planning to look for that kind of life is not because we are ruling it out. Um, I don't, I, I like, again, it goes back to like the scientific method, right? That's a, that is a, that's a, that's an idea that's plausible and possible, but I haven't seen anyone work out the test for the presence of that life just yet, right? Like if it's not carbon-based, how does that change? What, what else, what else about the, the organism does it change? And does that then change the things that are produced by that organism and the things we would look for to see evidence of that organism? And again, I think that's the kind of question that we'll address. It just won't be the thing that this sort of first generation of experiments is designed to address because we don't have the understanding of non-carbon based life sufficiently to know what the biosignatures would be. And, and by the way, I don't know if we have bio, strong enough biosignature science to, to, to conclusively find the life we have on earth, but it's part of the reason we want to do the search is so that we can refine our understanding of what a biosignature is in the first place. And with that refined definition, we might be able to, to, to, to think about how we would look for that other weird life that's, that's unlike what we have here. And that's true both on carbon-based life, but also non non-water-based life, life that would exist in a different solvent. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do you think would be the next step if we did find life on another planet? Oh, personally, uh, champagne and retirement. <laughs> I would <laughs> I'd be ready to to call it quits, not because I was upset, just because I felt like you know uh, that I'd achieved the objective. Um, I I think the next step is going to be people are gonna come up with counterclaims and um, other explanations for the data and, and will design follow-up experiments to, to, to put those two ideas and explanations against each other and, and find out which one's right. I think if we got through that phase and, and like kind of the whole scientific community had a con consensus that there was life around other worlds, then we get into this other fun area of like, well, first of all, you probably start to look for the signs of technology on that planet, right? Like the people that look for the signals from civilizations, all, all of their telescopes, their, their radio arrays and stuff, like all the SETI stuff would be pointed at that one, like a lot. Be a very directed SETI search there. And the other thing that I think would happen is we'd start to ask the questions that were coming up earlier about like, well, what's that life like? Like, what, are, what does it look like? Like, what is it doing? Like, how is it interacting with its host world? Like, does that light, even if we can't, if you know if there's no like civilization we can communicate with, what can we learn from that other life and, and how it interacts with its host planet? Um, I think those would be kind of the next questions. And then the other thing I think that's going to be interesting is, is if we find the life on more than one planet, right? Like, like, like, like we're going to look for it with this telescope that we're, I talked about, we designed, we're going to look for it on like 25 planets around, that, that, that are around other stars. If we found it on even, if we found it on none of them, that would be a sign to us that the kind of life we have on Earth, at least like oxygen producing global biospheres, like that would, we would know that that kind of life is very rare, less on less than 10% of the world's. So even in a failed search, we learn something. If we found it on one, okay, we know we're not alone and we're going to study that planet in detail. But if we find it on like two or three or five or 10 or, or 20, I don't know how common life is. Like that's the whole point of the experiment. But if we found it on more than one, now we're going to start asking, well, how is, how are those two planets different from us and how are they different from each other? And how is the star driving that? And how is the planet? Like, like those questions, like, like I, I'm going to be retired by the time the papers come out, but I, like, I can't wait for that. Like, it's going to be so exciting. Okay. So this question is from me. If we uh, find enough evidence for life, but no life started on the planet yet, can we trigger the life with adding missing part, chemical mm -hmm. or matter? So this is like if we found a habitable environment, can we can we initiate a bi biosphere on that world? No. Oh, I never thought of that. I mean, there are people that have tried to do this in the lab, and they've they've not been successful. Um, but a lab, I don't think, captures the complexity of of interactions that happen on the on a planetary environment. So I think it, it might be possible. Um, I. I think, and this is part of what astrobiologists do as well. It's not the, what I what I do, but there's a lot of astrobiologists that look into this question of why did life arise on Earth and how did life arise on Earth in the first place? Um, I think we'd probably need more research into that question before we had the power 
um, to be able to um, make conditions that would help life arise on another world. Um, I think we need more understanding of that. Um, although part of what I would ask is like, I mean, this is again the scientist to me, if we found a place that had all the conditions for life and we felt like we could just like, like, you know, do something, do it to, to get the life started. The, the, the curious scientist in me wonders like, well, what happened? Like why, if it's got everything else, like what, why isn't there life there? Was it just like random chance or was there something specific about that world that we haven't explored yet um, that's preventing the life from arising there? I'd want to, pro for me as a scientist, like that's the question that like, that that's like firing off in my brain. Um, but it would be, I mean, it'd be, it's an interesting thought. Like, what if we could? I don't know if we should. I don't know. It's like, this is why I think a lot of the research we do, we should, and I'm not saying we shouldn't, but like, I feel like that's a question we'd want, not just like, like geologists and astronomers and chemists and biologists involved. I think we want some like ethicists um, involved in that, that, that, that work too. Yeah, thank you. But instead of terraforming a planet, I think this is more epic for me because it's a natural process. It will be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah and, and it goes to whether people like how much value people place on the planet existing as it is versus like how much value they place on the presence of life on a world. And, and I, I mean, I, I, I, for me, I place the value at the, at the biology being there, but, but different people have other opinions on it. Yeah. And the next question, if a meteor hit the moon today, how long will, will it take to send a spacecraft to find out that life began on the moon? Oh. Um, so if I'm, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm understanding the, the full, um, the connection of those two parts. So if, uh, it, she is saying a mature hit the moon, but it has a life in it. And then, uh, oh. it started uh, a life on the moon. I think. Got it. Got it. Got it. Um, hmm. well, uh, right now the, what, what's interesting about that is, is the answer I give today is going to be very different than the answer I would give in like five or 10 years. Um, because right now we are, we haven't done a lot on the moon. We certainly don't have humans going there right now. We um, are only sending um, payloads to the surface. And when I say we, I'm not just talking about NASA, like, like uh, there's a, there's a Chinese lander on the moon. There's other nations that are now planning or have sent Israel sent something to the moon. There's a bunch of nations that are planning to get involved with this. Um, the cadence over the last 20 or 30 years of delivering robots to the moon has been slow and delivering humans to the moon hasn't happened at all. But in the next 10 years, that's going to ramp up dramatically. Um, and so today, like we wouldn't be able to do much for a few years because we're not planning anything that would go look for life on the moon, like in a meteor that brought it to the moon. And the nature of our business is like, because these things are so complicated and hard to build and easy to fail, and generally it's like a multi-year process to go from like having an idea for an experiment to like getting it to the launch pad. Um, so it'd probably be at least a few years before we would send something there. Um, unless we had like a specific reason to believe that there was life there and then I could see us like hurrying up. <laughs> um, but in like five or 10 years, if that, if that impact hit five or 10 years from now, there'd be kind of like a regular cadence of things going up there and um, including astronauts, including uh, humans. Um, and those humans might be able to just bring up, bring some samples back. Um, and then we'd be able to do the, the, the answer pretty quickly because you don't have to go through that like design and experiment process. You can just bring a sample home and use the labs we've got on Earth. So today, it happened like literally today, it probably would be a few years before we'd be able to, to look at it. But if it happened, the ironic thing is if it happened a few years from now, when, when, when NASA at least and other space agencies are planning to send humans back to the moon, if it happened in a few years, it might only take like months or a year. Um, so it depends when the impact happens. Okay. Last question. If the universe is growing and there is a movement during this growth, is there a change in the position of our galaxy in the universe? I believe the answer to that question is yes, but that's pretty far outside my expertise. I will say what, just as a, as like a follow-up, this telescope I've been talking about that we plan to build, um, let me go back just to talk about this one because I, I meant to show it halfway through the talk and I, my slides got out of where I was making them like at two in the morning last night. Um, 
I can this show slides. Yeah, okay. This is the telescope. Am I still sharing? Here yeah. Share. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is the telescope here. Um, this is the one I was telling you. This one's designed. It's designed to look for, for, the, for signs of life on like 20 or 30 worlds around other stars. Um, but that's not all it's designed to do. It's actually designed to be the best darn telescope we've ever had, period. Um, and it would have the capability to do a lot of the things that the Hubble Space Telescope is currently doing. Um, the difference is, um, oh gosh, my mouse is so sensitive. The difference is, um, I'm going to fast forward here through this. So this mirror here, mirror here is about the size of Hubble. This is the mirror we'd be collecting with. So this is a mirror that would have, you know, an order of magnitude more capability than Hubble has. And that's important because in addition to helping us search for life around other stars, that telescope is going to be so capable. It's going to do a bunch of science re regarding not just the cosmic evolution of our, our galaxy and the universe, but how other galaxies evolve, how they exchange matter between themselves and the, the, the, the universe around them, um, and how that process eventually produces the stars and planets that we plan to look for life on. So there's a broader story of cosmic evolution and that this telescope is going to be capable to, to tell. And I didn't even get into it today because I was just talking about the life, but it's, it's, it's, it's going to be able to answer those kinds of questions as well. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, your, your time and participating to our conference. Uh, we end up with the questions. So uh, we will continue with Dr. Ivan Paulina Lima. And thank you for joining us today. Okay. Oh, thank See you. you. Thank you for having me. As I said before, I, I truly believe this should be an international endeavor, um, you know, participated in by scientists across the globe. So um, I'm happy to be talking to a bunch of early career people, um, and especially in an, in, in an international setting, because because I, I really do think this is better when we're all we're all a part of it. So thank you for having me. I do appreciate it. Thank you so much. See you. Bye bye. Have a good one. Um, we will continue after a small break and maybe one or two minutes later, we will be in this link. Okay, see you.
Hello again. Welcome to our last session. I will not introduce myself because you already know me. <laughs> we will be ending our conference with Dr. Ivan Paulina Lima's presentation. And Dr. Paulina Lima is a biologist with a PhD degree in biophysics from the University of Rio de Janeiro and a master's degree in genetics and molecular biology from the State University of Londrina. He completed his postdoctoral research at NASA. He is currently a senior research investigator with Blue Marble Space Institute of Science. Dr. Paulina Limo will uh, be talking about surviving space radiation lessons from microorganisms now. Hi, okay. welcome. To Hello. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the, introduc for the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be um, it's a pleasure for yeah. us to having you here, really. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Did I forget to uh, mention anything about you? No, I think that's that's that's perfect. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, I need to share my slides. Let me see. Uh, I actually, think it's better you did. Way. You did. I can take it to the screen now. No, actually, yeah. this is the video. No, uh, oh, I, okay. I'm going to screen this video uh, in a moment on my presentation. Oh, okay. But I, um, because it's always better to to share the the video file rather oh. than than reproduce from the computer. But, but if you choose share and what a video, then you cannot share the screen again. You need to stop it and then share whole screen or slide. Yeah, but uh, I think uh, maybe you will be able to present the video later on. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. We can present that video later. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's how it goes. Uh, okay. I tried to do that, you know, the video sharing and didn't work in other times. But let's see. Let's see how it goes but here. It can, uh, I mean, audience can see when we uh, take it to the screen. If you want, we can take it to the screen and audience can watch it now. Yeah, uh, well, it's, it's going to be later in my presentation. But um, okay. uh, can you see my screen now? I can, but I can show to the uh, audience, but then uh, it will start the video. That's why I am not showing it now. Uh, okay, you need to change share and screen or slides or share screen, that button. OK, so I'm sharing my screen. Let me see. Can, let me see. OK, can you see my screen now? No, I can't. Uh, I yeah. think you need to close this. Close what? That a uh, video sharing, because it's it's the shared version. That's why it's not sharing again. I mean okay. your screen, okay. it's not sharing again. Uh, I don't know. This is StreamYard. I don't know really. <laughs> uh, okay. So how about now? Can you see my screen? No. Uh, so. Can you? Try again to share under the uh, yes. screen now. Share and share screen. Yeah. Uh, and then you can say entire screen, and you can even uh, click the share system audio, and then you can say share. Um, can you see that part? Oh, I, I, I'm seeing a message here. Um, Chrome has yeah, yeah. Lost permission to capture a screen. To fix, go to system preference. Let me see. Let me just try to fix that. Oh, okay. Uh, just a moment. Mm Yeah, so I, I changed the permissions uh, here at Google Chrome, but I have to restart my Google Chrome. So I, I think oh. I'll have to uh, quit and come back if it's okay. possible. Okay, we are waiting for you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. You're welcome. Okay, we will wait for Dr. Uh, Ivan Paul in Lima, and uh, he will be here in a minute, maybe. <laughs>
Okay, welcome again. <laughs> okay, let's see if that works. Now. Yeah, okay, we are waiting. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, now it's working. Oh, oh. So okay. In my screen. Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my presentation. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, so if I let me just, um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to do that uh, when the moment comes um, to share yeah. the video with everyone. Okay, so uh, you are seeing my full screen now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, just a moment. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. um, sorry about the uh, little problem. Uh, I had a problem with my browser. It, did, it lost permission to share my screen, so I had to fix that. Uh, thank you so much again for the invitation. It's a pleasure to participate in this initiative of astrobiology there in Turkey. Um, uh, so today I'm going to talk about surviving space radiation and lessons from microorganisms. So what, what can we learn studying the strategies used by microorganisms to survive radiation? Uh, so I'm going to start with a little introduction of the topic and then uh, discuss the effects of space radiation on biological systems in general, uh, show some discoveries and developments, and then talk about synthetic biology and uh, how synthetic biology uh, is already being used to do space exploration and then show some uh, future perspectives. Um, so I, I work for uh, Blue Marble Space Institute of Science, which is a contractor at, uh, at NASA, NASA Ames Research Center. So NASA uh, establishes contracts with different institutions um, to be able to uh, collaborate and, and uh, attract scientists and researchers to support different projects. And Blue Marble is one of these contractors. And I'm very proud to be part of this community of uh, researchers uh, that work with in astrobiology and, and many, many fields of uh, research related to exploration of nature and, and the universe. And uh, very engaging um, community with public outreach and this is, is exactly the activity that we that i'm, I'm uh, doing right now so this is a, an aerial view of uh, nasa Ames research center with the uh, wind tunnel we can see here um, the airfield and then here to the to the right um, the hangar one which is very it's an icon here in the bay area in silicon valley um, and our building is here um, uh, building N239, where we have the life sciences, um, many different researchers related to life sciences and astrobiology. Mm. So here is a, a few examples of uh, researchers that work of, with Blue Marble Space Institute of Science, our CEO, uh, Sanjoy Som, and uh, other researchers, uh, Milena Popovic, uh, Andrew Rios, uh, Carl Pilcher, we are very proud to have uh, the former um, director of NASA Astrobiology Institute, Carl Pilcher, with us. Mike Kubo, Jennifer Blank, Aaron Goldman, and so on. There are more than 60 researchers, active researchers, involved in different uh, researchers with Blue Marble Space Institute of Science. We are running the Young Scientist Program, which is a very successful program that uh, provides opportunities for um, uh, young researchers from anywhere in the world to, to participate in research uh, with NASA scientists and, um, and doing NASA research. So my field of, of research, broadly speaking, is the study of extremophiles and how they adapt to different conditions uh, on Earth. And we, if we think about the different types of environments on Earth, um, we can find examples of microorganisms thriving in the most um, extreme places from the physical chemical point of view. So when we think about the terms extremophiles, we tend to think that this is an anthropocentric term because what is what seems extreme for us, it's just normal for, for them, right? But um, some of the examples of extremophiles are very, very close to what is possible from the point of view of the stability of the molecules. For example, um, the deep, the, the very, very high pressure and high temperature of deep uh, sea beds where we have hydrothermal vents. So um, organisms in general, 
and particularly microorganisms living in these environments, they have to deal with extreme conditions that is very close to break apart the molecules. And we can think in the same way for other types of environments and other types of environmental challenges. But one way, one thing that we uh, find that is common to all these place, these places, are, is the, the the presence of water. Even in places like the Atacama Desert, which is the driest place on Earth, um, uh, microorganisms. Of course, it's it's a very very challenging environment, but microorganisms they survive there uh, for longer for very long periods of time without water, and then when the moisture becomes enough for them to germinate and proliferate just a little bit just to withstand another long period of, of dryness uh, they they just do that you know even in the atacama desert they also require water to be able to metabolize so water seems to be the unifying um, uh, requirement for life in every type of environment and we think this is the case uh, for environments beyond earth as well and that's why NASA uses this uh, principle uh, to follow the water, to search for life elsewhere. <clears throat> and the study of the extremophiles, of course, gives us a broader perspective on the kinds of environments that we uh, could potentially find life beyond Earth. And the more we investigate nature, the more places we visit, and the more um, research we do, uh, the more exotic forms of life we find, and uh, this only broadens, broadens our perspective on the places and types of environments that we can find life elsewhere. Uh, this is uh, um, uh, the last um, uh, decade, decade of survey on astrobiology. It was published in 2015. Uh, you can download here in this website. Um, uh, describing the future investments on the different types of research related to astrobiology. Uh, we, uh, there is a new one that was re uh, released last week uh, that includes the, all the missions that are, uh, space missions that are related to astrobiology. Uh, but, but this is a very good introduction and I use this document. I like this, the, this picture because it shows a very nice uh, overview of, astrobi of what astrobiology is because it shows the extreme environments here on Earth with examples of uh, hydrothermal vents, uh, of the hydrothermal uh, vents of the Yellowstone National Park, uh, some other examples like the Mono Lake, very al uh, alkaline environment here on Earth. And then it shows some potential uh, habitable worlds uh, here in the solar system, the planet Mars, uh, the moon Europa, and Celados of the gas giants and other um, places. And then the comets that has uh, uh, is thought to, to have had a, a huge contribution bringing um, uh, organic molecules and, and the building blocks of life through, throughout Earth's history and a little bit of water as well. And then in the background, uh, the Milky Way galaxy showing the potential and the huge development of the field in astronomy called the exoplanet research. Um, so this is very, very, in one picture brings um, the concept of what astrobiology is. And in this document, there's a table of the different categories of extremophiles. You can see here uh, on the left column, the, the different factors that we use to classify the different types of extremophiles. In terms of temperature, we have high and low temperature and then pH, high and low pH, radiation and pressure and salinity, low nutrients, oxygen tension and chemical extremes. And then in the second column, we have uh, the, what, how, how do we how do we name these organisms? Uh, so for example, high temperature they can be thermophiles or even hyperthermophiles, the ones that grow at very very high temperatures, and then low temperatures we call them psychrophiles for those that um, have an optimal temperature below 15 uh, degrees Celsius, and then so on. You know the alkaliphile and acidophile. And uh, here in the middle, we have the defining growth conditions. And this is all parameters that we establish to study them, right? Um, the, these organisms, they, they are not uh, phylogenetically related necessarily. Uh, we have some examples of organisms in the, the right col column to the right here. 
And uh, of course, my particular interest in the different kinds of extremophile uh, organisms is uh, the radiation resistant ones. And in my PhD, I used one model organism called uh, Dinococcus radiodurans to test its limits in terms of resisting extraterrestrial environments, extraterrestrial radiation. Uh, so I used a lot of um, different types of radiation, ionizing and uh, uh, non-ionizing radiation, UV, um, charged particles to simulate the, the solar wind and so on. So we did a, uh, a series of studies to better understand how well the uh, life, on, life as we know here on Earth could uh, resist and tolerate other kinds of environments beyond Earth. And why I'm interested in, in studying the, radi the effects of radiation on, on biological systems? Well, we know that uh, radiation affects uh, many, many, many things uh, that we, we, we are related to. For example, it impacts satellite communication when the, there's a, uh, a burst in activity in the sun. So it emits a, a higher intensity, a peak of radiation that affects satellite communication and, and, and can damage, physically damage uh, uh, electronic components. But I'm, of course, interested in the biological effects. Uh, so radiation can interact well, with biology in different ways. Uh, the most ener energetic ones can physically break apart the molecules, especially DNA. And, and this has severe effects on, on the behavior and the uh, response of biological systems. Here is a chart of uh, how the radiation environment looks like uh, beyond the Earth's magnetic field um, at the bottom here, comparing to other sources uh, here from the top until uh, the um, period on, on, on the ISS. So we, we see here that uh, the Mars Science Laboratory, this is data from the Curiosity rover uh, on its way to Mars. So I think this was published in 2013. So we can see here that the, uh, during the period of approximately nine months, the instrument, uh, RAD instrument on board the spacecraft measured 466 millisieverts of radiation. This is way beyond uh, what is um, experienced uh, by an astronaut on the ISS, which is protected by the Earth's magnetic field. And uh, that is 75 millisieverts. And, uh, this is a unit to measure radiation. So the, in order to go to human um, deep space missions, we have to think hard on, on this problem of radiation. I think that's the, the what is uh, in practice stopping humanity for doing long-term missions. Uh, we don't have a good way for to, to shield this radiation. Some of this radiation can um, cannot be stopped even with a very thick uh, layer of lead or water. Some of this radiation will also be very threatened, uh, threatening for, for, for biological systems. But we can learn with uh, biological models and that's what uh, uh, I'm trying to do in my, my line of research, and there are many other researchers doing very interesting developments in, in this area. So this is the uh, bacterium Dinococcus radiodurans, which is the most radiation-resistant microorganism that is uh, very well characterized. There are other models that have present um, the same or slightly level, a higher level of, uh, of resistance. Uh, but most of them, as we can see here in this uh, chart to the, to the left, uh, they are less resistant to Dinococcus radiodurans. Um, and this chart uh, shows the survival in the y-axis here in a log scale. So this is 1%, this is 10%, and so on, uh, as the dose increases here in the x-axis. Uh, uh, measured in kilograms. This is ionizing radiation, so it's gamma rays very energetic um, that can break apart DNA molecules. And this organism, Dinococcus the uh, it can repair this DNA damage caused by radiation. So it's not that they can protect themselves. They feel the effects and they suffer the effects of radiation, but they can repair and restore its entire DNA molecule in, in a matter of a few hours, actually. Um, it forms these uh, tetrades, so they exist at uh, clumps of two or four uh, cells, 
they have several copies of its genome, so they have a little bit of redundancy here that adds up to contribute to its uh, resistance. And so these are survival curves comparing the different organisms. And if we take the LD10, which is the lethal dose 10, the lethal dose that uh, leaves 10% of survivals or kills 90% of the population, we have the different values here, right? For each one of these survival curves. And then if we plot this LD10 in another chart, um, comparing the LD10 with the intracellular manganese to iron ratio, we see a trend here. So there's a role of this parameter, the intracellular manganese to iron ratio. Um, and I'm gonna explain to you why manganese and iron is, are involved in radiation resistance. First, we have to understand uh, how the uh, radiation uh, interacts with the cell. This is a general scheme that was published uh, in 2010 by Hornick, uh, Gerda Hornick and, and, and collaborators in a, a very nice review called Space Microbiology the, uh, that reviews the effects of the space environments on, on microorganisms and they talk about the effects of radiation. So radiation can interact with, cell in, with cells, biological systems in different ways. First way is the direct interaction that is uh, that it ha happens with DNA. So it can uh, affect DNA in many ways, but the most severe interaction is when it breaks apart the DNA molecule, causing single strand or double strand breaks. This DNA needs to be repaired, this damage, damaged DNA, and in order to restore the genetic information so the cell can continue its metabolism. But this can uh, uh, induce error in this repair, uh, changing the genetic information. And this, uh, depending on the level, of the extent of this change, it can lead to cell death or cell mutation. Um, it, the other way is the indirect effect when the radiation interact with other, interacts with other molecules and water, because water is the main component of a metabolizing cell. Um, so the, the, the interaction of radiation with water and other molecules uh, generates a lot of free radicals. So depending on the dose, uh, you give like a shower of you know, free radicals um, that interacts, that ends up interacting with DNA, um, like increasing the damage and can also interact with enzymes and, and membrane. So enzymes include the DNA repair enzymes that would I suppose should do the repair. Um, and also all of these uh, together can uh, lead to mutation or cell death. And all of this is uh, influenced by the environment, of course, the amount of oxygen in the system during radiation, temperature and pH, and whether the cell is hydrated or dehydrated. So for example, spores that are very, very dehydrated, they tend to resist more uh, higher doses because of course they have less water Right. So all of this is, is influenced by the environment. This is basically the same uh, scheme, uh, but it's comparing a resistant cell uh, on the bottom and a sensitive cell at the, at the top. So the sensitive cell, we already know what happens, you know, uh, interaction of uh, radiation with a lot of uh, cellular components, um, the damage caused by hydroxyl molecules are uniformly distributed. Um, but the damage caused by hydrogen peroxide and superoxide, they have site-specific protein damage and they can you know, affect the ability of the cell to repair the DNA and then can lead to mutation or, or cell death. But what happens with a resistant cell? The resistant cell can uh, accumulate anti antioxidant metabolite complexes of manganese. So manganese can combine with these uh, nucleobases and, and uh, short peptides and amino acids, and then end up scavenging the effects of oxidative stress, the, uh, protecting the cellular components from the oxidation caused by the, the uh, oxidative stress. And, and then the proteins, the DNA repair enzymes remain active and they can do their job of restoring the genome. 
Um, but it's not only the manganese. Um, the, in order for the cells to be resistant, they have to accumulate high levels of manganese and low levels of iron. Because if they have both iron and manganese, iron induces a lot of uh, uh, um, reactive oxygen species by the phantom reactions. So you want to decrease the amount of iron and increase the amount of manganese in order to uh, be more resistant to uh, oxidative stress. This is the, the types of, of uh, metabolites that can interact with manganese and provide this shielding, this protection, this scavenging effect. This was uh, it's a publication that was released by um, uh, the group of Professor Michael Daly, which is, by the way, um, the group that established this correlation uh, between manganese, the effects of manganese, and, and all the physiological conditions for an organism to, to be resi very resistant to radiation. And it's, uh, it has a lot of publication publications in this area. So um, for my postdoc, after I completed my studies uh, in Brazil uh, for my PhD, uh, doing a lot of exposures, uh, uh, like tar torturing Dinococcus radioderms in different ways to uh, increase our knowledge about their survival um, beyond Earth, um, we came up with this idea of looking for radiation-resistant organisms in, in dry places, in deserts. Because if we think about what happens with a cell when it's dehydrating, um, there's a lot of things that goes on. And there's a there's a biochemical stress, there's a metabolic stress, a physical stress, and a physiological stress. So just by physically imagining these cells uh, shrinking because it's dehydrating, you can imagine a, an increase of concentration of uh, salts and, and metabolites, and of course the reactive oxygen species. And also the DNA molecule can physically break when you shrink a cell. Uh, so these, all of these can need to be repaired for the cell to be resistant. So organisms that can resist uh, dehydration, they tend to be resistant to, to radiation as well because radiation also um, induces similar type of damage uh, on, on the cellular components. So our hypothesis was whether Dinococcus radiodurans would be the last frontier of radiation resistance, or there could be other organisms even more resistant than Dinococcus radiodurans in nature. And of course, we cannot cultivate in the laboratory everything that we wanted, you know, from nature. So we are limited by our ability to cultivate microorganisms. But this is an area that is it's being developed um, very fast in the past uh, years. But we, um, explore these possibilities, whether other organisms could accumulate higher levels of manganese, they could have a more efficient DNA repair tool set, they could produce unusual antioxidants, secondary metabolites. So I went to, to desert environments. So I went to the Atacama Desert um, to collect some samples and expose these samples to UVC radiation. Um, the protocol was quite simple. Uh, we just sprinkled these uh, sand samples over an agar plate and then um, exposed to a fixed dose of 300 joules per square meter, which, half, which is half of the dose necessary to kill 90% of a population of Dinococcus radiodurans, uh, but it's high enough to kill most of the population. But still, we could recover very uh, a lot of uh, different types, uh, morphotypes of colonies of microorganisms that were able to grow on the agar plate. And then we, we selected these organisms um, to do our screening. I also collected samples from the Sonoran Desert in, uh, in uh, Arizona. And we were uh, followed by a, a crew from the NHK uh, broadcast television in Japan. And uh, there's a little bit of uh, the procedures uh, uh, of this uh, expedition in a documentary called Cosmic Front, episode 18, if I'm not wrong, about terraforming Mars. So you can uh, look this, this up, this Cosmic Front documentary. Uh, we talk a little bit about um, these uh, resistant organisms. So the results that we found, uh, so we found a, a, a surprising diversity of radiation resistant isolates, particularly from the Atacama samples. 
<clears throat> so we compare the Atacama samples with the manganese, with a manganese mine in Arizona, in the desert. So it was actually uh, an environment with uh, enriched in manganese. And, and the Atacama, the Ames Research Center, we used some samples from here, from the Ames Research Center as a control. And we also compared two different methods, the filtration method and the sprinkling, sprinkling method. So the sprinkling method was the preferred one, what, what, what we use for future analysis, because it provided a much higher diversity of organisms as shown here. Um, because it interferes less in the microbial community. The filtration, the procedure involved resuspension of the soil of the sand in a, in a saline buffer. So it's already a very drastic stress for the, for the, for the community there. So only the tough organism, basically uh, bacillus, you know, spore farming bacteria could be retrieved with the filtration method. So if you want to, to know the diversity of a place, you just sprinkle you know, the the samples, the sand soil particles on, on the agar plate, so you interfere less with the microbial community. That's what we show here. And of course, the higher diversity of the Atacama compared to the other uh, samples. So then we had a, a huge amount of, of isolates um, uh, and we tested these uh, isolates against a new round of uh, radiation with a single dose, same dose, 300 joules, but this time they were not protected by the soil particles. They were the isolates that were grown and then uh, purified, provided, uh, uh, produced a cell suspension. And then this cell suspension was exposed to this type of radiation. And now we have a better idea of their true resistance. And we plotted them in a chart comparing to Dinococcus reticulans here at the top and at the very bottom, E. coli, which doesn't show any survival for this dose. But we have a gradient of resistance. Uh, so a lot of different organisms, microorganisms can resist very high doses of radiation. Here, the, uh, the survival fraction is presented in terms of, uh, in a logarithmic scale. So this is 100%, 10%, 1%, uh, and so on. And here we selected the two most resistant uh, isolate and um, to UVC radiation and compared to Dinococcus reticulans in blue. And we see that Hymenobacter, uh, it's a common organism found in deserts, uh, as well as Gelderm Geldermatophilus here. They both present uh, resistant above uh, Dinococcus reticulans to the highest level. And I'm, I'm going to explain why they have these different shapes in the, in the survival curve. But uh, we can see here that uh, Hymenobacter is definitely more resistant than Dinococcus reticulans to UVC radiation uh, in all doses. And Geodermatophilus is more resistant to the, uh, if you consider the highest doses. But still, if this is for UVC radiation, for, for ionized radiation, the gamma rays, um, Dinococcus is still the champion. You know, uh, they have a very specialized DNA repair mechanism to repair uh, the double strain breaks. So they're very good at it. And they have several copies of the genome that, you know, uh, that uh, contributes for them to be very resistant to very tough radiation. But still, Hymenobacter and Geodermatophilus are very good models because uh, you see here the level of radiation that they survive. You know, the LD10 here is like more than five kilograms, which is huge. This is like more than a thousand times higher than what would be necessary to inactivate a, a human cell, for example. So if we had this level of survival, anyone, any, any survival level here uh, shown in this chart, radiation would not be a problem for hum, deep, uh, human deep space missions uh, if, we have, if we had this type of resistance. Unfortunately, our resistance levels, it's a thousand times less and we have to learn with them and see how we can uh, adapt these strategies to benefit us and other biological systems. And this is why um, the uh, one organism presents uh, all uh, resistance to, to UVC radiation in, uh, higher than Dinococcus radiation to all doses. Uh, here on the left, Hymenobacter, it doesn't form cell clumps and it doesn't produce 
a strong pigment. It's a very, very light pink. So pigments is not contributing. We think that it's not contributing a lot to, to protect uh, against radiation. So the major mechanism here would be DNA repair. And we are looking at it and see to find out uh, what are the uh, DNA repair machinery that it's using. Um, in comparison here to the right, the gel dermatophilus organism, uh, it forms cell clumps, uh, produces a lot of extracellular material and including a very dark pigment <clears throat> that could all contribute to its resistance. So the, the, the first dose that we see here in the chart here, uh, they are inactivate fast uh, and then the, the resistance goes up and this is because uh, only the cells that are in the, the middle of a clamp uh, will show up uh, in highest dose because the, the cells uh, in the exterior of this clamp will be inactivated but preserve the cells in the, in, in, in the bottom, which is in a lower number, we will only show up in the highest doses. The other thing we found out is we tried to establish a correlation between manganese, the availability of manganese and iron in the environment and the survival of um, resistant organisms. As we can see here in the chart to, to the left, uh, we compared the LD10 for UVC radiation uh, using 300 joules per square meter for all the different uh, organisms. And at the, the bottom here, the manganese to iron ratio from the environment where they were isolated. And as you can see, there is no correlation here. It's uh, uh, all over the place. But then we selected the most radiation resistant ones and the, the least radiation resistant ones and plotted in a chart that resembles a lot the other chart that I showed. Uh, but this is the first time that this same result is, is demonstrated for environmental isolates um, with UVC radiation, so confirming the role of manganese and, and iron ratio on radiation resistance. And now we have a collaboration with Professor Kazuharu Arakawa from KU University in Japan. Um, we selected only the members of actinobacteria um, belonging to two genera, Arthrobacter and Cocuria. Um, and then they repeated the experiments and uh, provided a very, very nice uh, gradient of organisms. So here uh, I'm showing highlighted all, uh, only the members uh, the actinobacteria from the pool of organisms that we had. Here we have the gradient of only these two. Um, and uh, we are now doing uh, whole genome sequencing to compare side by side exactly uh, what is different, what could make them more resistant. And they are very ph phylogenetically related, closely related. So this, we think that could provide uh, interesting information on the molecular mechanisms involved. And some publications are already being um, available, like this one, the complete genome sequence of Arthrobacter strain MN0502. And we will continue this type of, of work. And now we are thinking of other ways to probe the resistance of organisms without the need of cultivating, because uh, we know that uh, we, as I said, uh, we are limited by our ability to cultivate organisms. So there may be organisms that are resistant to radiation, but they rely on, on the production of some metabolite from a sensitive organism. So if, if we only try to cultivate organism, we will lose uh, other things that could be going on in nature uh, just because we cannot cultivate organisms. So we are currently developing uh, methods to, to study uh, this part of the biological resource, which is most of the biological resource that exists in nature. One thing that came out that is very interesting, uh, came out from uh, our studies here, is uh, the, the role of these microorganisms, uh, pigmented organisms, uh, in informing us about uh, potential biosignatures uh, on exoplanets. So what would be the signals that we could remotely detect on, on, on, on planets, on exoplanets? Um, so we know that these organisms produce a lot of different types of pigments, different colors. Most of the reflectance spectrum that we had to date until 2015 was uh, about the vegetation uh, red edge. So the uh, they were looking about the reflectance of, of chlorophyll. 
uh, and we our catalog we extended these um, database to other colors uh, because microorganisms produce pigments of, of, of a broader range of colors so the idea was to measure these reflectance absolute reflectance spectra and um, in a very very um, a careful way, you know, just to make sure that we were measuring was only the reflectance spectra uh, so that uh, astronomers could use this uh, as a reference or as a, as a guide, you know, when they are uh, receiving signals, you know, analyzing spectra from exoplanets. You know, the, the previous um, uh, lecturer here, um, Sean Damagal Goldman, he talked about the James Webb Space Telescope and, and the, the potential that it will have uh, in terms of uh, searching for biosignatures of exoplanets. So this database would contribute for this uh, endeavor, for this effort. And this is the type of data that we uh, measured. We did that for 136 uh, microorganisms with an integrating sphere, as we can see here in, this, in these figures. Uh, so we produced a microbial mat on a filter paper and then we place this uh, microbial, artificial microbial mat uh, inside the integrating sphere, which reflects more than 99.99% .99 of all the lights uh, that uh, is uh, emitted and uh, introduced in the system. So we could measure the, the reflectance. So we have a light source here, a uh, sample holder, and then uh, our fiber optic sensor that uh, measured the absolute reflectance spectra of, of these microorganisms. Uh, and here we can see um, the visible spectrum, visible range here uh, in the beginning of the X axis. So for this particular sample, which is very dark, we see a very uh, low reflectance in the visible, of course. But in all samples, we saw these two characteristics, uh, absorption bands of water. Um, which is characteristics of, of any metabolizing cell. And the interesting thing is, if you leave the system for long until it becomes dehydrated, these uh, bands will, of course, disappear. Uh, so this has uh, this tells us that um, if we want to measure metaboli metabolizing organisms that is based on water, we will see these. Uh, we expect to see these bands, and then um, these reflectance. Uh, and the visible region also could inform us uh, of types of pigments that uh, these organisms in exoplanets could have. Now, in terms of synthetic biology, we know that uh, human space exploration rely on biology uh, in different aspects, and this uh, reliance will only increase if we, term, if we think about long-term missions. And within biology, there's something called synthetic biology, which is uh, the evolution of uh, molecular biology and genetic engineering. Uh, we now, today, we call it synthetic biology because we have the potential not only to read the genetic code, but also write new sequences and uh, create new uh, genetic circuits and, and processes that don't exist in nature. So we can come up with uh, things to optimize, drastically op to optimize performance of different biological systems. And uh, if we think of a scenario where uh, biology is used in different uh, steps in a production chain, uh, we can see the potential of synthetic biology, you know, uh, for improving the, the performance of different organisms, microorganisms that we use today here on Earth, for example, in the food industry for producing uh, different types of food, uh, pharmaceuticals, medicine, and so on. All of these will be exported will be used uh, in, in, in other human outposts beyond Earth. And synthetic biology, of course, has a huge potential. Actually, it's key to develop and, and achieve uh, a reality where, where we will be able to sustain um, a human base uh, on the Moon, on Mars, and, and other places. Um, so uh, one of these, one of particular example about how synthetic biology could be could leverage you know human space exploration is actually the uh, the potential of uh, the use of cyanobacteria so cyanobacteria only needs uh, co2 
uh, you know, as a carbon source. Some of them can also fix nitrogen, the diazotropes. They, uh, they need water and micronutrients that are already present on the surface of Mars, for example. And they, of course, need uh, light and um, uh, solar radiation, energy and heat to produce organics and uh, other products that will be used for, uh, by other organisms to produce a lot of different things, uh, food, um, um, materials, and clothes, drugs, bricks, bricks, etc. So with this idea in mind, in 2011, uh, so since 2011, our, our laboratory here at NASA uh, holds the IGEM, the International Genetically Engineering Machine Competition, at, uh, at Professor um, Lynn Rothschild's lab. And um, 2011 team from Brown and Stanford University had this idea to engineer a cyanobacterium to produce and secrete uh, sucrose uh, to be used um, by another organism, Bacillus subtilis, which is a model organism used in different industries, so that it could produce a lot of different materials. So it was a proof of concept project, and they were able to, to engineer uh, cyanobacteria and uh, produce and secrete sucrose. So it was a very successful project. In 2013, we were visited by uh, representatives of the DLR, the German Space Agency, that um, um, provides, provided an opportunity to fly a, a biological payload on a, on a satellite, on the Eukropis satellite, the German uh, Eukropis satellite. The acronym is for one of their experiments, Euglena Combined Regenerative Organic Food Production in Space. The satellite was actually launched in December uh, 2018. And uh, we actually took a ride in this, in this mission with a secondary payload called Power Cell. Power cell means uh, one organism providing power or energy uh, for the growth of the other organism. Demonstrate uh, and this mission would demonstrate this concept in space and pave way for human space exploration of Mars and Moon. We also had a transformation in space, uh, uh, an experiment, genetic transformation. For the first time, we performed this in space, paves the way for uh, symbiotechnology in space. We also had a protein production uh, experiment uh, that didn't work so well because of one, we had a problem with one reagent and our positive control growth in LB. All of these were, uh, was performed in a, in a micro, micro plate, a microfluidics plate with 40 weight wells uh, of 70 microliters in each well. So here's a cross section of, these, of uh, each well. So basically we produced a miniaturized spectrophotometer to monitor cell growth to do uh, growth curves. Uh, so the samples were launched dry and then once they were in space, they were filled with culture medium. And then uh, we did a time series uh, measuring um, the optical density of the culture medium uh, through time. And uh, we were able to establish uh, growth curves. And so this microfluidic uh, card goes into a payload module uh, with a LED uh, source and a, and a detector at the bottom and a thermal spreader a biological uh, a payload assembly module. So has to, uh, a payload that's, uh, enclosure has two payload modules each, and we have two payload enclosures. So four uh, microfluidic cards in the satellite. Here's the satellite, an image from, from DLR with our uh, plate here. The other is in the other side. These are the solar panels deployment test. And after uh, building all of these, we have to uh, test uh, the resistance to vibration, which is a condition that happens during launch. And of course, when this happens, everyone is happy um, uh, because otherwise we would have to start all over again and, and, and, and do the test again. Here's the control room uh, in Bremen, in Germany, with our German collaborators in this mission. And now we have that video uh, uh, that let me, let me see if I can share the video. Um, just just a moment. I think it's going to be better than trying to uh, show here in the presentation. I don't know if someone could just uh, select the video to screen. Yeah, yeah, I will. Okay. Stage two is pressing flight. Launch reactor on countdown one. We are go for launch.
Okay, let's uh, come back to the presentation. Uh, can you just select? Yes, I think you are seeing my screen now. Are you seeing my screen? Yeah, we are seeing your screen now. Okay, perfect. Uh, so we have, so this was a very nice video that was produced by Blue Marble, uh, highlighting an important aspect of our mission, which was uh, in situ resource utilization, you know, the potential for this kind of, of organism, of, of, of approach, of experiment, um, uh, you know, to contribute for in situ resource utilization. So we now know that we can do transformation in space, that we can use these organisms uh, to grow uh, in space, so maybe their performance will, will be similar to what we, we see here uh, on Earth in different gravities. Uh, so we have a lot of valuable information about this mission. For example, we have over 400 days worth of mission data, being 50% 50, 50 flight data and 50% ground data. Um, uh, we have observed microbi microbial growth in all four gravity regimes because we <clears throat> because the, the, the satellite uh, was a cylinder, we could simulate the gravity of Mars and Moon just by rotating the satellite around itself. <clears throat> so an artificial gravity, uh, in a sense. Uh, so we had the microgravity without rotating uh, Mars, Moon, different levels of rotation in our ground control here on Earth. So four gravity rate regimes. So we observed microbial growth in all these four gravity regimes. We have successfully transformed uh, Bacillus subtilis in microgravity. Um, so observed successful growth of Bacillus subtilis on cyanobacterial cell extract in three out of four uh, gravity regimes. All hardware and software work as, uh, as planned. Uh, we have demonstrated the ability of hardy bacteria spores to recover from a long-term stasis period, which will be fundamental for the human deep space missions. And this is very important because, you know, we had to uh, wait for uh, two years uh, for a launch opportunity. So these, our experiment had to be designed to, to account for this wait. So we were limited because of this time frame. And luckily we used this, uh, um, uh, there is this, this bacterial spores and we used uh, Bacillus subsidies, which has a lot of flight heritage. It survives five years in space, six years in space. Uh, so we use that. We also have valuable long-term reagent stability data, including antibiotic efficacy. Uh, so when we buy antibiotics for experiments or uh, in, on the shelf in the pharmacy, they say that it's good for six months. That's n they don't say that it's not used beyond, it's not useful beyond six months. Uh, they only say six months because that's the limit that they tested. No pharmaceutical industry will test, will test antibiotic if efficacy for years and years. This is interesting for a long-term mission, like the human space missions, right? And we have data showing the antibiotic efficacy of one of antibiotic uh, for more than five years, stored uh, in liquid form at room temperature. So that makes us think what else can be uh, use, useful uh, beyond the year scale, you know, multi-year scales. Uh, and so we have numerous lessons learned from hardware design to experimental operations that are leading to improved designs and capabilities for future missions. And then future perspectives, uh, we, uh, we are studying radiation resistant metagenomes from, from, from extreme environments using an approach uh, that allows us to, to probe the resistance of uh, organisms without the need of cultivation. Um, there's also the possibility of applying these pigments in food and cosmetic industries, because uh, one of the problems for, uh, for example, the food industry is the problem of allergy uh, when using synthetic pigments. Um, it's, synthetic pigments are the most uh, cheap, uh, the cheaper, the cheapest, and they uh, cause less allergy. Uh, uh, cause, uh, they are the cheapest, but they cause more allergy because they're synthetic. Uh, if we find pigments that are natural uh, born uh, from extremophiles, they could potentially be applied in the food industry. Um, and then synthetic biology, uh, we, we think that we could engineer radiation resistance in, in, resistance in different biological models that will be crucial for developing uh, long-term deep, uh, deep space missions. Um, and we can also use a lot of space simulation experiments and ground controls to test all of these um, experiments. Um, we are going 
coming to a close for my presentation here. I don't know if I'm extended too much, uh, but I just would like to draw your attention for this opportunity here. Uh, I'm the uh, special issue editor for, for the journal Life on a topic called evolution of radiation resistance. So if you are doing something related to the evolution of radiation resistance, and this could include, include uh, synthetic organisms, uh, synthetic uh, biology for uh, radiation resistance, uh, new biological models that you guys are describing, you know, uh, everything that relates to evolution of radiation resistance, we, you could submit for review. Uh, I think the uh, publication fee here is 1800 chess, uh, Swiss francs, I think which is like $1,900, uh, but there's a discount if you publish until, I think it's 20% discount if you submit until June 24. I'm also the um, editor of another special, special issue for the journal, uh, journal of, of Visual Experiments with my friend Simon De Chione on synthetic biology for space technology. So if you have uh, something related to this topic, you can just submit using this link uh, and with that, I just would like to acknowledge um, my point of contact today at NASA, Lynn Rothschild, and uh, many uh, different researchers that contributed to uh, a lot of these findings along uh, the past years. Um, uh, they are here, and also the uh, funding agencies. I came to the U.S. with a Brazilian fellowship uh, from uh, the Ministry of Education, and then I moved to a NASA postdoctoral fellowship, and then I moved to uh, being a researcher uh, at NASA with uh, contractors. And I would like to finish my presentation with this uh, thought that the Earth is the cradle of humanity, but no one, but one cannot live in the cradle forever. And that doesn't mean that we are abandoning Earth. Uh, that's the contrary. Um, and space exploration provides a lot of tools for us to better manage our environment here. We just need to think about, you know, the climate change and, and how satellites can uh, protect the environment, help us to uh, be prepared for natural disasters and so on. So Earth is going to always be a top priority for space exploration just because it's our home. But does, it doesn't mean that we will stay only here forever. We will expand our presence in, in space. We will establish human outposts and uh, spread ourselves. But we are not going to abandon Earth uh, for many reasons. It's our home. It's our best place to, to live. There's no other place better than Earth for us to live. So uh, space exploration actually contributes to better manage our environment and better take care and, and, and teaches us a lot about our environment and other environments as well. So thank you so much. Here are my contacts, uh, my email, uh, my social media. And if you have any questions, you can just get in contact. And if there's time, I'm available to take questions. Thank you so much. Okay, <laughs> thank you for your presentation. It was really awesome. And uh, yeah. I'm I'm doing a master's degree on microbiology and I'm planning to build my astrobiology career on microbiology. That's why it was inspiring for me so much. <laughs> thank nice. you. Nice, nice. <laughs> thank you. So uh, for the questions, I will uh -huh. start with first question. Can other parameters in the space environment affect the level of radiation that these microorganisms can survive? Other effects of the space environment is affected. Yeah, so this is something that we are still learning, for example, how how organisms would respond in, respond in space against radiation, because um, how to test, uh, you know, do survival recovery. We would have to do that in microgravity, for example. What's the role of microgravity on the DNA repair me mechanisms? I don't know. I'm not aware of studies, you know, uh, in, uh, analyzing the effects of microgravity, for example, on radiation resistance. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of things to be developed. Um, so one thing that I can think of is microgravity. It could influence uh, the dynamics of the DNA repair yeah, machinery. Okay. So how will the evolution of the Earth's living things be after exposure to radiation in a possible adaptation process? Um, after exposure to radiation, a possible adaptation process. Um, let me see, I'm trying to figure out the best way to approach this question. Uh, 
um, after exposure in a possible adaptation process um, well uh, in terms of adaptation you know if uh, one uh, living being uh, be adapt uh, becomes adapted to radiation uh, for example, we can think about uh, Dinococcus ureodurans. You know, I told that uh, the dose to inactivate a human cell is uh, like a thousand times less or more than Dinococcus ureodurans. That's would that would be like five uh, grays, right? Uh, Dinococcus ureodurans uh, appears not to even sense radiation uh, below sixty grays. So 12 times more, it doesn't even sense. It doesn't, you know, doesn't feel radiation um, be, below 60 grays. It only starts to, to take action after the radiation goes above 60 grays. So if something becomes adapted, that's what I expect to happen. You know, we, are, we can tolerate a, a lot higher levels of radiation, just like Dinocox do, does. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know Atacama Desert is so similar to Martian soils, and your diagram was showing plenty of various types of bacteria. Therefore, can we find same same bacteria or fossils of them at the Martian soil? Okay, good question. Uh, okay, so uh, one parameter that we use to compare the Atacama Desert with Mars is the dehydration. Of course, it's very, very dry. Sometimes uh, the Atacama Desert uh, becomes even drier than uh, special places on Mars, uh, where humidity can reach uh, levels higher than the Atacama. But this is only one parameter. Mars is much, much um, has a much lower temperature, average temperature, and um, of course is exposed to higher radiation for billions of years. So we expect that the surface of Mars is practically in sterile. Because even Dinococcus radiodurans would die in the surface of Mars because of the accumulation of, of damage. Mm -hmm. Because on the surface of Mars, the Mars organisms cannot metabolize, cannot repair the damage, and the, the damage only accumulates with time. So even Dinococcus would die in the surface of Mars. So we could have uh, microorganisms in the, in the subsurface of Mars. On a, on a depth of about 10 to 20 meters, we have the potential to find some forms of life because that's the depth where the cosmic radiation is attenuated enough for us to consider the possibility of having some organism. But there are other challenges, you know, there's a very, very low organic uh, content, so they don't have plenty of food to exist there. So I think any life that we could find on Mars would be remnants of a uh, very, very distant past where we know that Mars were, was inhabitable. So that's going to be really, really difficult to find. Uh, we would have to, to investigate in very, very deep um, uh, subsurface or close to, to the uh, subsurface rivers, you know, the, the uh, streams that we find precipitating in some craters on Mars. Um, so I don't think there's going to be that high diversity uh, on Mars. And we, we know that here on Earth, there's a lot of bacteria everywhere. And winds can transport bacteria and they fall in the desert. And that's something that uh, if there's no much biodiversity in Mars in the first place, we want to see them in the surface. Yeah. Okay. How long did it take for the microorganisms to, to develop radiation resistance? Yeah, so that's a that's an interesting question. We we there are several organisms that are resistant to radiation. Uh, the uh, the common sense uh, in, in the scientific community, in the common um, opinion, is that radiation arose as a result of the uh, adaptation to dehydration, because there's no place on Earth with such high levels of uh, radiation that this organism resists to. Uh, but there is, uh, there are a lot of places with uh, hydration and dehydration cycles everywhere. So this is a, was a more sp uh, widespread environmental conditions to select for organisms resistant to dehydration. Um, we don't know exactly, but uh, I think it was very brief because we have examples of organisms that are, uh, are very deep rooted in the tree of life 
that are resistant to, to radiation. We just need to think about these cycles of rehydration and dehydration. Um, so I would say, you know, a uh, few million years uh, after life started, uh, they actually had to cope with this. We actually think one of the possibilities of the origin of life was this uh, hydration and dehydration. So they may be uh, some organisms that were born with this uh, capacity of, of resistance to, uh, to radiation, and this was lost once we found other environments. I don't know. Uh, this is something that we could answer after we collected these uh, different papers that I'm uh, asking for this special issue in the uh, journal Life. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, we know that tardigrades survive in extreme conditions. They tried to send it uh, into space, but they were unsuccessful. Do you think other living groups other, uh, other than tardigrades, except extramophils, can survive radiation? If it does, could it be a conscious creature? Yeah, when you talk about conscious creature, like more complex, I think it's hard because we have different systems and components. We are like a, a huge, um, a very, very complex organism that rely on different systems. I don't know if we... I can't think of an organism that has a uh, conscience um, coordinating all the steps necessary to become resistant to dehydration. Um, tardigrades is, is the best example of a complex organism. Uh, it's one of the best examples that is very resistant to, to, to dehydration. Uh, it was actually tested with a very, very high vacuum and, and cold. It's a very tough type of animal. Yeah, it's also an animal. Uh, it has its own phylum, uh, tardigrata, uh, and, and it's the most complex uh, creature. Uh, well, it's it's it's a complex cre creature that uh, is very very resistant to dehydration to the levels of spores, you know, of bacterial spores. Um, and I'm not sure if a conscious creature would be. Uh, that resistant, we would have to think about, you know, something like transformers, <laughs> uh, some very, very highly adapted function that would allow a, a very complex animal to be able to, you know, shrink and not be damaged by the by the effect. I think it would be very difficult. Mm -hmm. Can we mimic the radiation resistance to the, our next generation with uh, genetic engineering to survive in the space? Yeah, so I think that's the, the whole idea for future research, you know. Uh, radiation uh, conditions can be mimicked in the lab in different ways. Um, even, even cosmic rays, you know, cosmic radiation. There's this um, uh, national laboratory here in the U.S., uh, in Brookhaven, that can provide very high mass, high energy uh, particles uh, that can very uh, accurately simulate the cosmic radiation in space. Um, so the idea is in, the, in future research to use synthetic biology to genetically engineer organisms to resist this kind of, uh, this level of radiation, this type of radiation, and then test if they can perform uh, as best, uh, as good as they, they perform here on Earth in these in this special conditions so that we can, we can make sure that they will work in other worlds. Mm -hmm. Why did the bacterial species you studied develop so much radiation resistance? Is there enough radiation on Earth today to allow these bacteria to evolve like this? Yes, no, there's no selective pressure in terms of radiation itself. I think the most, the most radiation, naturally occurring radiation levels uh, on Earth is in Guarapari in Brazil. Um, uh, but it's only like a few milligrays per hour. It's like we well, uh, uh, it's not enough to to select organisms radiation resistant. So the the the uh, scientifically accepted hypothesis is that the evolution of radiation resistance was a result of the adaptation to dehydration. Um, but this is you know everything we know about radiation resistance comes from what we are able to cultivate in the laboratory. So maybe there are other things out there that we don't know. But for sure, we don't know any place here on Earth that provides enough radiation to act as a selective pressure to evolve microorganisms 
uh, radiation resistant microorganisms. That's why we think that is a result uh, of resistance to dehydration. Mm -hmm. How can we use the artif artificial intelligence for choosing the material that can protect us from space radiation? Okay, so uh, yeah, um, I can try to answer this. Uh, first, we would need a uh, dat database of the different types of materials that could protect us. Um, and then uh, generate input for this database with different types of, of materials and then uh, come up with a way for testing and selecting the best materials. But of course, artificial intelligence is not my area of expertise. Uh, but what I can tell is that uh, no material can protect against the highest forms, highest energy forms of radiation. Uh, we can just think about uh, like a deep uh, cave. If we go to a cave, like very deep, and with a with a, an instrument to detect very special types of radiation, we can still detect. So even like a mountain, you know, cannot shield some types of radiation. Of course, uh, we only even here on Earth that we can st still have the uh, magnetic field, right? So we will always be exposed. Actually, radiation is thought to have had an, a role in evolution. You know, there's some people that try to establish correlation about supernova explosions uh, affecting biodiversity on Earth. Uh, and we know that we are exposed to radiations like the sun, the ultraviolet radiation that affect organisms living on the surface. And we can think about other um, types of radiation that uh, from time to time becomes increased uh, with the variation, the seasonal change in the uh, magnetic field, uh, causing a variation in protection. Um, that's, that's what we know about radiation, you know. Uh, uh, and that's how I, I think we could use artificial intelligence, uh, just selecting the best materials that could protect. But uh, I'm not, uh, it's not my area of research. Okay. Um, so can your uh, Ogliana Krupp, is that um, research show us uh, also that lichens survive in the space? Well, yeah, so the Okropi satellite is a platform. So I don't know if the Germans have opportunities, uh, future opportunities for other experiments, um, but it would be great to test uh, lichens. Lichens um, is it's a very nice uh, model of organisms with a uh, symbiosis of uh, fungi, fungi and uh, algae and different types of lichens that they have been tested in space uh, before. Um, yeah, so I think it could be used uh, in future research. Yeah, also some lichens. of them have some bacteria that yeah. some of their models. Uh -huh. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next question, which planet would you most like to collect samples from and bring them to you so that you can find answers to current research questions? That's a good question. There's a, um, if I have to pick one, right? Um, let me see. I think we ha we can do a lot by exploring uh, uh, Mars and other hot spots for life in the solar system, like the moons of the gas giants and ice giants, uh, with robotic missions. But to collect samples and bring back, uh, then I I cannot help but think about the feasibility of such an endeavor. And the easiest to do this is from Mars, uh, which is the closest one. But even though it's it's a it's a huge endeavor, it's very it's going to be very very expensive. Uh, but if the question is how I would uh, what which planet would I most like to collect samples? Okay, planet. Uh, let me see. I think it would be yeah planet Mars. Uh, but there are other interesting places like uh, Europa from Jupiter, Moon of Jupiter, and Enceladus that would I really would like to I read I really would like to to uh, watch and inspect the sample. Yeah. Okay, so your answer is Europa. <laughs> okay, so yeah. the last question. 
after the power cell is sent, if the bacteria we sent create life on Mars or other planets, what kind of life could emerge? Does life continue through algae as in the formation of the world? Well, um, yeah, it depends on the place where it will uh, be sent to. For example, on Mars, um, it depends if it's a controlled and in a in a process that it's a proposal. If we want them to create, then we can do anything with them. But if it's accidental, if the question refers to something accidental, uh, then it depends on the place where it's going to land. It's going to if it's going to land on Mars. If it's it's going to be just sit there in the surface, it's going to be sterilized with time. But if it lands on Europa, for example, there's plenty of water. Uh, there and the water is a salty water like our oceans so they will just spread there and go on a different uh, parallel evolution you know and then uh, it's hard to predict what the evolution is going to be because evolution is uh, it's a non-purpose process you know um, it depends on the environment uh, so the, it depends on the selective pressure that they will be there um, uh my guess is if if they stable if the environment is stable enough they will just remain as algae and will not change much so they will not evolve but if there is a lot of selective pressure a lot of radiation that we know that uh, you know there's a strong magnetic field from from uh jupiter that could channel some types of radiation to europa or some other types of environmental challenge that would force them to evolve then they will uh, assume in other form and, and incorporate those changes during the, their evolution. So I think it depends. If it's accent, accidental, it's going to depend on the environment that we will land. Okay. Thank you for answering our questions and thank you for uh, participating in our conference. It was really awesome to listen to you. And the video was awesome, really. Uh, <laughs> my hair stood on end. <laughs> it was. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm always emotional for those type of videos, but the, this one was really best. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. I think um, uh, Raphael, uh, our video producer. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. OK. Uh -huh. yeah. I All didn't right. know he can do those type of things because I was uh, under his mentorship. Yeah, uh, not Rafael Loreiro. It's uh, oh, Rafael. Okay. It's another Rafael. I forgot his surname. That's why I didn't say. Oh, okay. It. Rafael, Luis Mendes Pena. Oh, okay. Um, yes. <laughs> I will not forget that name also. <laughs> Thank you for participating to us, and uh, we, we are end of the uh, our conference now. Um, so <laughs> I hope to see you in next uh, conferences or next uh, events. OK, thank you so much. I'll be glad to, to participate if I have a chance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Uh, I would like to express my sincere thanks to all listeners uh, who patiently follow us until the last minute. Thank you very much for your interest and patience. I, in your, our conference and thank you for accompanying us this far. <laughs> Unfortunately, I sadly have to say that we are at the end of our conference here. I hope you enjoyed and learned as much as I did. However, we look forward to seeing you among us at our third International Astrobiology Conference, which we plan to continue this tradition next year. See you at the next events and stay with science and curiosity. Let me invite my team to say goodbye to you. Hoş geldiniz. Hoş bulduk. Konferansımıza sonuna kadar katılan bütün katılımcılar için çok teşekkür ederiz. Gerçekten bu konferans üzerinde gerçekten çok fazla emek verdik. Ve e, sizlere astrobiyolojiyi tanıtmak, e, bilimi yaymak, e, sizi bu konulara teşvik etmek için böyle bir konferans düzenledik. Umarım e, önümüzdeki senelerde aynı şekilde bu konferansları düzenlemeye devam ederiz. Gerçekten tekrardan teşekkür ederiz. Emre? Evet, ben 
birkaç cümle edeyim. Ben de Berra gibi tüm katılanlara teşekkür ediyorum. Biz yalnız bırakmadıklar için. Yine geçen seneki minvalde uluslararası ölçekte, gerçekten adındaki uluslararası ölçekte bir astrobiyoloji konferansı yaptık ve gururla söylüyorum ki bu gerçekten Türkiye'nin en büyüğüydü. Ee, bu da ekibimizin MBG Türkiye'nin ve tüm katılımcılarımızın hepimin ortak bir başarısıdır. Ee, bu süreçte yanımız olan, yanımızda olan sponsorlarımıza, hocalarımıza, siz değerli katılımcılarımıza, herkese, herkese çok teşekkür ediyoruz. İyi ki varsınız. Çok keyifliydi için gerçekten. Ee, diyorum sözü bırakıyorum. Bence zaten geçen seneki en büyüğünün üstüne bugün, bu senekine eklersek daha kimse bizim önümüze geçemeyecek astrobiyoloji konferanslarında. <gülüyor> Geçmişte da helal olsun. Demek ki rekabeti yükseltmişiz demektir. Bunlar evet, da zorluyoruz yani. <gülüyor> Aynen öyle. <gülüyor> ee, bizden, ekipten başka gelecek yoksa biz vedamızı bitirelim. Yok gelmeyecek sanırım. Gördüğüm kadarıyla. Tamam. Evet. tamam. Ee, bizi de fotoğraflar, fotoğraflarız herhalde. Ben de şuradan esas alayım. Evet, o zaman el sallayalım. Evet, görüşürüz herkese. İyi akşamlar arkadaşlar. Görüşmek üzere, iyi akşamlar. İyi akşamlar. Sağ olun. İyi akşamlar.